Welcome to EdTech Live. We're happy that you're here today. I'm Tamara and this is Ryan. We would like to take a moment and welcome you to today's event and give you a little information about what to expect. New sessions start every hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of personal needs. During the live event, you also have two sessions each hour to choose from. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. During each session, the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link you use to access the attendance forms and you will enter the code onto the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you will have to do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit if you are watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting your attendance, you should be receiving a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, please resubmit the attendance form and double check to make sure your email address is typed correctly. We, along with our whole EdTech team, want to thank you again for being here today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon. We all like to see so many cool gifts. Did you know that you can make a gift right inside of Canva? Open up one of your projects and you will see text and graphics. Notice at the top the word animate. When you click the word animate, look at all the different type of animations you could add to your graphic. If I click simple, you can even see it at the right. It will preview it. I'm going to click fun because I like to have fun. Once you are finished choosing your animation, go up at the top, go to share and go to download, then click the file type and you're going to just simply click get and download it. And voila, you now have a GIF. Welcome to EdTech Live. We are happy that you are here. I'm Ryan and this is Tamara. We'd like to take a moment to welcome you to today's event and give you a little information about what to expect. New sessions start each hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions that you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of personal needs. During the live event, 
You also have two sessions to choose from each hour. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. During each session, the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link that you use to access the attendance form and you will enter the code into the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you'll have to do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit even if you're watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting <laughs> your attendance, you should be receiving a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, please resubmit the attendance form and double check to ensure that your email is typed correctly. We, along with the entire EdTech team, would like to thank you for joining us today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon. I love EdTech Live because it keeps me up to date with the trendy technology for today's scholars. Have you ever wanted just a tiny bit of a YouTube video that you found online to show your students? The new YouTube clip feature will allow you to do just that. From your YouTube video, click on clip at the bottom. This will open up a pop-up where you can add your description. YouTube clips can be between one and 60 seconds and you can choose the exact time that you would like your clip to be. You can also click and drag the handles to determine how long you want your clip to be. Once you're done, you click on Share Clip and you'll get a unique URL that you can use that will only be for that little tiny clip that you have created. Welcome to EdTech Live. We are happy that you are here today. I am Tamara and this is Ryan. We would like to take a moment to welcome you to today's sessions and give you a little information about what to expect. New sessions start every hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of your personal needs. During the live event, you have two sessions to choose from for each hour. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. 
During each session, the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link you use to access the attendance forms and you will enter the code into the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you will do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit if you are watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting, you should receive a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, please resubmit the attendance form and double check to make sure your email address is typed correctly. We, along with our whole EdTech team, thank you again for being here today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon. If you accidentally delete or move or do something that you didn't mean to do on a slide or a document, don't worry, simply press Control Z as an undo button. Welcome to EdTech Live. We're happy that you're here today. I'm Tamara and this is Ryan. We would like to take a moment and welcome you to today's event and give you a little information about what to expect. New sessions start every hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of personal needs. During the live event, you also have two sessions each hour to choose from. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. During each session, the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link you use to access the attendance forms and you will enter the code onto the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you will have to do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit if you are watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting your attendance, you should be receiving a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, please resubmit the attendance form and double check to make sure your email address is typed correctly. We, along with our whole EdTech team, want to thank you again for being here today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon.
We all like to see so many cool gifts. Did you know that you can make a gift right inside of Canva? Open up one of your projects and you will see text and graphics. Notice at the top the word animate. When you click the word animate, look at all the different type of animations you could add to your graphic. If I click simple, you can even see it at the right. It will preview it. I'm going to click fun because I like to have fun. Once you are finished choosing your animation, go up at the top, go to share and go to download. Then click the file type and you're going to just simply click get and download it. And voila, you now have a GIF. Hi, this was my first time doing a TED Live and I really learned a lot. It was informative. I really loved it. Yeah. Welcome to EdTech Live. We are happy that you are here. I'm Ryan and this is Tamara. We'd like to take a moment to welcome you to today's event and give you a little information about what to expect. New sessions start each hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions that you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of personal needs. During the live event, you also have two sessions to choose from each hour. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. During each session, the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link that you use to access the attendance form and you will enter the code into the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you'll have to do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit even if you're watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting <clears throat> your attendance, you should be receiving a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, please resubmit the attendance form and double check to ensure that your email is typed correctly. We, along with the entire EdTech team, would like to thank you for joining us today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon. I love EdTech Live because it keeps me up to date with the trending technology for today's scholars.
Have you ever wanted just a tiny bit of a YouTube video that you found online to show your students? The new YouTube clip feature will allow you to do just that. From your YouTube video, click on clip at the bottom. This will open up a pop-up where you can add your description. YouTube clips can be between one and 60 seconds and you can choose the exact time that you would like your clip to be. You can also click and drag the handles to determine how long you want your clip to be. Once you're done, you click on share clip and you'll get a unique URL that you can use that will only be for that little tiny clip that you have created. Welcome to EdTech Live. We are happy that you are here today. I am Tamara and this is Ryan. We would like to take a moment to welcome you to today's sessions and give you a little information about what to expect. New sessions start every hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of your personal needs. During the live event, you have two sessions to choose from for each hour. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. During each session, the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link you use to access the attendance forms and you will enter the code into the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you will do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit if you are watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting, you should receive a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, please resubmit the attendance form and double check to make sure your email address is typed correctly. We, along with our whole EdTech team, thank you again for being here today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon. If you accidentally delete or move or do something that you didn't mean to do on a slide or a document, don't worry, simply press Control Z as an undo button.
Welcome to EdTech Live. We're happy that you're here today. I'm Tamara and this is Ryan. We would like to take a moment and welcome you to today's event and give you a little information about what to expect. New sessions start every hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of personal needs. During the live event, you also have two sessions each hour to choose from. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. During each session, the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link you use to access the attendance forms and you will enter the code onto the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you will have to do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit if you are watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting your attendance, you should be receiving a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, please resubmit the attendance form and double check to make sure your email address is typed correctly. We, along with our whole EdTech team, want to thank you again for being here today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to EdTech Live. I am Ryan McLaughlin Davis. This is Connie Wood. We are instructional technology specialists here in CFISD. We are so happy that you're here with us today. We have some great sessions lined up. And uh, Connie's gonna go ahead and tell us how this event works. Well, first of all, you're joining uh, us in channel A, which is the fun channel, by the way. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. It's gonna be a little <laughs> different over here. So we have four sessions that are live, but you can watch the rest later in your own time. As long as you get the credit in by midnight on Sunday, you'll be essentially getting eight hours of professional development from this one amazing event. And by the way, I want to thank Ryan and Tamara for doing such an awesome job putting this on with the rest of the team, but they really work hard. So we can all thank them for this great PD we're getting today. Hit me in the feels way too early, Connie, <laughs> way too early for that. All right, during each session, we are going to be sharing an attendance code with you guys. You will need to either write it down on a piece of paper or have a Google document up and open um, so that you can keep track of them all. At the end of the event, we're going to open up attendance forms for you to submit the codes to. Now. We ask for your help during the event. Please do not write or type the attendance code in the chat because it'll be deleted anyways. But we really appreciate you guys helping us with kind of monitoring that and keeping track of that. Um, to do this, mm, I forgot to start off with, you can talk to our presenters. You can ask them questions through the YouTube chat. To do this though, you do need to be logged into your um, YouTube account. So. Up first, we do have Dr. Kristen Matson. She is joining us um, from the Chicago suburbs. Uh, so welcome to <laughs> the nasty muggy weather of Houston virtually. Um, <laughs> she is the managing partner of Edvolve, a consulting company that empowers educators to implement and reimagine digital citizenship education. She is also an adjunct at the University of Illinois and the author of two ISTE books about digital citizenship. Kristen, we are so excited to have you here today. And um, I'm looking forward because I'm looking forward to the session because digital citizenship is a serious, it's a hot topic right now. And I think it's really good to learn new ways um, to teach our kids about it. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for having me, ladies. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Yes, ma'am. You are good coming in loud and clear and we see everything on your screen. Awesome. Awesome. Let's go ahead and kick things off then. Um, my name is Krista Matson. If you're a 
Twitterer, a TikToker, an Instagrammer, or a Facebooker, you can probably just search me up at Dr. K Matson and connect with me there. Uh, I am the managing partner of a, a consulting group called Evolve, and you can find our Evolve Twitter account at Digit Doctors. So I'd love to connect with you, um, kind of beyond this session. Like Ryan said, I am an adjunct professor at the School of Information Sciences at uh, the University of Illinois. I teach pre-service teachers and practicing teachers and school librarians all about media and information literacy, digital citizenship, and digital ethics, and also do lots of professional development around the country with, uh, with educators. So today we're talking about a topic uh, that I like to call digital forensics, mostly because young people think it sounds really cool when you tell them you're going to teach them about digital forensics. And uh, I think it's a really, really important topic. I want to kick us off by giving us a little bit of context for why our digital citizens need some of these skills. I'm gonna show us a short video. This video doesn't have any audio at all. So if you don't hear anything, it's okay, I promise. This video was posted on Facebook in October of 2016, and it essentially accuses uh, folks of, of uh, having voter fraud in the 2016 Democratic primary elections. And so in this video, we see uh, some different voting spaces <laughs> uh, labeled with parts of the US. This one's supposedly in Illinois. And this gets a little lengthy. We're not gonna watch the whole thing. I'm gonna kind of fast forward a bit. We move from Illinois. Uh, supposedly to Pennsylvania, where we see some uh, other fine ladies here with, with papers and desks. Here goes that ballot stuffing. All right. The video sort of continues on and we switch scenes again now in Pennsylvania. It's like maybe an elementary school gymnasium. More, more people doing some voting. Lots of papers going into that box over there on the far right. And the video just continues to kind of switch between these different scenes. Um, Adding in some captions along the way. Here we're supposedly in Arizona, witnessing the worst case of all. And then the video kind of ends with a, uh, you know, sort of a, an accusation against Democrats for engaging in voter fraud. So this video was actually part of a study from the Stanford History Education Group. And this study was conducted in 2018 with middle school students, high school students, and undergraduate students at Stanford. And the researchers at Stanford put together a series of different information tasks and asked these middle school, high school, and college undergraduate students to sort of tackle these tasks. And the goal of the researchers was to observe the ways people went about trying to uh, you know, make sense of the things that they were seeing online. So the question that the researchers posed alongside of this video was this one. Does this video provide strong evidence of voter fraud in the 2016 Democratic primary election? Just some statistics from the research. Nearly 3,500 high school students were assessed. Um, one of the tasks was the one you just saw, and 52% of students believed that this video constituted strong evidence of voter fraud in the United States. 52% of high school students believed that that video constituted strong evidence of voter fraud in the United States. Only three students out of the 3,500 that were uh, assessed even attempted to track down the original video. 
looking at some other information tasks that the students were given, two thirds of, of middle school students could not tell the difference between a news story and an ad that was labeled with the word sponsored content on a uh, web page called Slate. And 96% of students struggled to uh, understand why ties between a climate change website and the fossil fuel industry might lessen the credibility of that website. Of the 3,500 students that were assessed, 90% of them received no credit at all on four of the six tasks. So when we think about the fact that our young people are already digital citizens, they're already engaging in the world of the internet, and they're coming across all sorts of content, everything from advertisements labeled sponsored content to videos like the one you just watched on Facebook. Uh, it is really, really important that part of our digital citizenship education is around this idea of information, misinformation, and information literacy in general. We know that misinformation is abundant. And I think what this study also shows is that our old teaching strategies are no longer working. I am a former school librarian and I spent lots of time teaching my students things like the crap test, where we looked at a website for its credibility and reliability and authorship and purpose. And we would spend, you know, 20 minutes kind of digging around on a web page and trying to fill out these worksheets and forms and figure out, is this a good website or not? Um, but looking at a video like that one and seeing how many of our students are kind of failing these information literacy tasks, I think we do have to pull back a little bit and go, are the ways we were teaching uh, still relevant? Now, digital forensic strategies, like the ones I'm gonna to talk to you about this uh, during this hour, might help students a bit more than the outdated sort of crap testy kind of worksheets I used to have students fill in. Um, plus it sounds super cool. Kids are like, what, forensics, awesome. Now, I will tell you that digital forensics is also a very, uh, established field where we've got folks who work for the government and who work for different companies who are using super specialized software to do all sorts of really cool forensic digital digging that you and I are not going to do and that you and I don't have the software to be able to do and that our students aren't going to do. But what we can do is give our students some tips and tricks um, to help them sort of be these pseudo detectives and figure out uh, if what they are viewing is fact, fiction, or somewhere in between. So digital forensics, again, we can think about it as this field that FBI agents are engaging in and using this specialized software. But when we just pull it back a little bit and look at the definition, digital forensics is really just a structured process of uncovering, collecting, identifying, validating, and interpreting electronic data. And we can do that on lots of different levels. Uh, I posted something for sale on Facebook Marketplace over the Thanksgiving break. Uh, I don't have slides for this because I go off script. This is what I do. And um, I had within an hour of posting this more expensive, I posted something for $850. I had someone who was very interested and she said, I'm in New York this weekend. I can't pick it up. I want to sell you the money um, so that you know I'm interested and I'll come pick it up later. And I said, okay, here's my email address. You can sell me the money. And I got a very interesting looking email from uh, from Zell. It had the Zell logo on it. It had very official like, you know, little trademark icons and things. And it said, your Zell account has been locked because it is not a business account. And in order for you to establish a business account, you have to send money to the receiver and then they're going to send you money back. Like the email was very fishy, right? And so a digital forensicist, that's not a word, me, a digital citizen, wanted to kind of start going through this process of figuring out, okay, I have this piece of electronic data. I have this, this email supposedly from Zell. What can I uncover about it? What can I identify in it? What can I validate as true or false? What can I interpret and learn? Uh, long story short, this was a, a longstanding scam 
that is being run through Facebook Marketplace. Um, but I was able to go through this structured process of looking at the email address that the email came from. And it was a Gmail address. And I was like, why would Zelle have a Gmail address? Like Zelle's a big company. They would have a Zelle email address. Um, and then I, you know, I went and did some Googling and read some articles and checked my Zelle account and there was no money there and no notifications in Zelle. But it was this very structured process where I had a set of tools in my toolbox that allowed me to navigate that piece of electronic data and make good decisions about it. And I thought to myself about my own father who likes to buy and sell things online and who isn't as digitally savvy as I would like him to be. Um, I think he probably would have fallen for that scam because he didn't have the same, he doesn't have the same toolbox that I have. So digital forensics can be really fancy, can be a field we send students into, but it can also be a set of tools that the average digital citizen like you and me can use. So let's look at some of these tools that are just for, you know, your average Joe and Jane. Observation is really, really important. And that's what I did with that Zelle email, looking at the email address that it came from closely, actually opening up the full email address, because when it came to my inbox, I only saw the beginning piece. I didn't see the at gmail.com. I had to like open it up and take a close look. Zooming in, which I guess is what I did, right? I actually opened up the email and read it a little bit closer. We're gonna look at a tool called reverse image searching, which kids love um, and can be a lot of fun to use in the classroom. We're gonna talk about lateral reading. And then I'm gonna show you a really awesome uh, Google extension that allows us to do some key frame analysis. It's probably the closest thing to like a free CSI tool that you'll be able to introduce to students. Uh, and then I have a couple other websites and extensions that I wanna share with you. Now you can take fast and furious notes if you'd like, but everything that I'm gonna recommend and share with you today, I have curated on a Wakelet board that I will share with you at the end. So so feel free to take notes, but also know I've done some of that curating for you. All right, so how can I go about getting students interested in this type of work? Uh, I think brain teasers and just general like interesting inquiry prompts can be a great way to introduce some of these tools. So when I'm in person with uh, you know students or, or educators like yourselves, we would actually go through this activity step by step together. Um, and so if you want to try it on your own, feel free. I'm just going to kind of walk you through it since we can't have as much back and forth today. But I have a photograph and the question that I have for you is where was this image taken? Like, can we find like a city state? Can we find an intersection? Can we figure out um, I don't know what country even it is in, where was this image taken? So posing a, an interesting question like this to students can get them excited and wanting to find an answer. And it will allow us to introduce some tools to help them do that. So the first tool in our disposal is just observation. We have background knowledge, which is very powerful. And if we slow down with a piece of information and really take the time to look at it, uh, it's amazing what sorts of connections we can make. So I'm gonna just go back to the photograph really quickly and I might give students a minute to just write down all of the things that they see and observe all the things that they see and observe in this photograph. You've got a minute, go ahead, students go. And then we'll do some sharing out. Students typically notice the snow. Um, they notice a bus stop, larger buildings, some police tape with English words on it. That's important. It helps us figure out where we might be. Same way that the snow is kind of important too. Uh, we also noticed that the cars were on the right-hand side of the road. Can help narrow some things down since some English-speaking company, er, companies, countries <laughs> drive on the opposite side of the road. Uh, and then one really big clue is that theater because we've got the name of the theater right there. And, you know, there's probably only so many places where that theater might appear. So we have a list of evidence. And the question to ask students next is, 
you know, which of these pieces of evidence is most likely to help lead us to an answer. And that Pantages Theater is a pretty big clue. So what we can do is teach students this concept of lateral reading. And the idea of lateral reading um, is that when we are on a computer and we are investigating, let's say, a web page uh, or a video like that Facebook video, we can learn a lot by observation, but we can learn even more by like moving away from the thing that we are investigating, opening up a new tab in our computer and doing just a little bit of Google searching. So the idea of lateral reading comes from the idea that as we're investigating, we may end up getting more and more tabs opened up across the top of our screen. And we're sort of digging laterally. What do, what do other sources of information uh, teach us or tell us? And so when I was investigating the Zelle email, uh, I went and Google searched like the Gmail address that it came from. I Google searched, there was like a trademark at the bottom um, some company. And so I Google searched that company. Finally, I just Google searched like Facebook marketplace and Zelle scams to see what I could find out. Um, even when I had that fishy feeling, I knew I needed to move away from the email to learn more. So we could do a Google search for the Pantages Theater. This is this process of a lateral reading. And when you do, um, you get a few results. I think there was some in Canada as well that I cut off the screen. Um, top three results are the Hollywood Pantages Theater, the Pantages Theater in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the Pantages Theater in Tacoma, Washington. So I've got three possible locations now where this photograph could have uh, been taken. And again, it's this systematic process that we're giving students to help them analyze this digital content. So now we've narrowed it down a bit. Let's kind of zoom in on the picture and see what little things we might notice. And so teaching students to actually take their fingers on their iPad or on their phone and kind of zoom in, or how can I use my mouse to, to wheel in and scroll onto an image? What might I see upon a second look? So when I zoomed in on this photograph, I saw a couple of things and I wish I had cool FBI tools that would let me like unpixelate the picture, but I don't. Um, I noticed behind the bus stop a banner, uh, looks like a professional basketball team. I can't really see any words, but I do see that they are wearing blue and white uniforms. So that is another clue. I might look up the NBA teams for those three cities and see what their uniform colors look like. When I zoom in on the police car, I do get sort of a grainy uh, like city police and then some other grainy words. And maybe if I squint hard enough, I can kind of see a P-O-L-I-S at the end. And then when I zoomed in on the theater, I got a really big clue. I noticed that not only I had the name of the theater, Pantages, but I also had the name of the show that was playing there, Gypsy, and I had the dates of the show, February 13 to March 13. And that seemed like a pretty good clue um, that could help me really further identify where this photograph was taken. So I'm gonna go and do some more lateral reading. And again, teaching students that this is sort of a cyclical process that I'm gonna gain information and investigate. And when I learn, I'm gonna go ask more questions and then I'm gonna go and investigate further um, that this isn't necessarily like a quick one and done. It is an ongoing cycle of inquiry. So going back to my Google search, I now typed in Pantages Theater, Gypsy, February and March. And all of the results that came up were from Minneapolis. Now it makes sense with the snow, right? I'm not gonna probably be at the Pantages Theater in California. Uh, when I kind of squinted at that police car, it looked like it said Minneapolis on the back. Um, I could probably go and look up the Minneapolis NBA basketball team and see what their uniform colors are. I have ways to sort of check my thinking now. And after students sort of come to this conclusion, I like to challenge them even further. 
So you figured out where this photograph was taken. Awesome. But what's the context of it? What do you think happened that evening? Why were there police there? Um, do we have an idea of when this photograph was taken? What year we're in? Can we figure out anything more than just the where? And so now having modeled some of these processes for students, I can let them work in pairs. I can let them work independently to try these processes out and find out even more information. I can also introduce some additional tools to their toolbox. So one tool that kids get really geeked out about, and they're always like, oh, I've seen this on MTV's Catfish, is the reverse image search. And students are used to going to Google Images and typing in a word like cat and getting a whole bunch of pictures of cats. But not all of them know that I can take a particular picture and pop it into Google Images and do the reverse where Google will tell me all the places where that particular cat picture lives online. So let me give you a little demonstration of how to do a reverse image search. Going to Google Images, slow this down, I recorded it, but it's quick. Um, going to Google Images, and instead of just typing in the word cat, dog, whatever it is I'm looking for, I'm going to click on that little camera button. And the camera lets me upload an image from my computer or paste an image URL. So I had saved that picture to my computer, snowy accident. I uploaded it. And sure enough, Google found the, the picture right here and says there's about six results for this picture. So when I click on it, I'm able to get the actual articles where that image appeared. And now I can click on the article where that image appeared and get all the information that I could possibly want about the context of that image. So reverse image search, pretty powerful tool. Another really great tool for reverse image searching is called tineye.com. So sometimes you want to cross-reference maybe what you find in a Google reverse image search with a, a different source. tineye.com, good place to do reverse image searching. Um, I love modeling reverse image searching with uh, an image like my social media headshot and show the kids like, hey, this is my Twitter profile, pro profile picture. My Twitter profile is public, meaning it's indexed by Google and you know anybody can kind of see it. Let's upload my Twitter profile headshot into a Google reverse image search and just see what happens. And they're amazed at all the places where my professional headshot kind of shows up. And I'm always surprised too. I'm like, oh, somebody mentioned me in a blog. I didn't even know that. And, and my headshot is listed or, you know, alongside of their blog. Interesting. And so I encourage them to try using some of their own pictures that they know are maybe publicly out there and see how far those pictures have maybe traveled. Now you can help students practice using just those three tools, maybe four tools of observation, zooming, and lateral reading with a really fun game called geoguesser.com. Geoguesser.com drops, it's great for like a, a geography class or, or a, a social studies class. They will drop you into the middle of a Google map, like a Google Earth map street view. And you have to move around walk around, observe what is around you, um, and try to pinpoint an exact latitude, longitude of where you are in the entire world. So sometimes you're dropped in a place and the, uh, you know, the writing on all of the signs is not English and you're trying to figure out where you are. But um, really fun way to get students practicing those three tools um, and figuring out where in the world they are, geoguesser.com. All right, so let's try another one. We're going to just look at a, a quick example here. This is a, another Facebook post, Peter Walker, March 15th, 2019. He said, a friend posted this picture of last night's storm in Sydney. 
think there might be a craft in there somewhere. I think he's referring to aliens. Um, but you can see that this picture kind of took off. 1,000 reactions, almost 5,000 shares. People thought this photo was pretty cool uh, and, and wanted to spread it around the internet. Now, doing a reverse image search, um, I can find out where this image, where else this image appears online besides Peter's Facebook post. And when I conducted a reverse image search of this particular photograph, look at what my top result was. My top result was a Snopes.com article. Uh, Snopes is known for sort of debunking urban legends and viral myths. And so I clicked on that Snopes article to see what they had to say. Not only did they say this was a, a false picture, Snopes went so far as to find the two original photos that had been merged and photoshopped together to create this crazy storm over Sydney. Oh, we're going to pause here. <laughs> I forgot about our pause point. We're going to pause here for just a second um, to give you the information about your attendance. So if you are in district, you've got one bit.ly. And remember, bit.ly's are case sensitive. So the CFISD there has to be capitalized for your bit.ly to work. If you're out of district, make sure you capitalize that V-I-S-I-T-O-R. And the secret code for this session is the word digital. So again, you're going to just write this down, type it up in your Google Doc. Don't put it in the YouTube chat. Um, Hang on to it because that attendance form will open soon and you'll be able to prove that you are here learning all about digital forensics. Keep it up there for just a second. All righty. Are we ready for some more tools? We've looked at zooming and observing and lateral reading and reverse image searching. Some kids are like, I know all that already. What else do you have for me? So let's let's look at what else we've got. Sometimes um, we have things come up online that are about a context, right? Like, what is the context of that crazy storm photograph that we were looking at? What's the context of that? Uh, snowy scene in Minneapolis, Minnesota. What was the context? By the way, the context of that Stanford History Education Facebook uh, post was that that was video of voter fraud, um, but it was footage from Russia. That And, and in one of the uh, scenes, you can actually see the Russian flag hanging in the background. And so what we call that is uh, misinformation being, it's called um, a manipulated context. So the footage was real, but the context had been manipulated and therefore it became a piece of misinformation. So sometimes it's just teaching kids to learn about context, but other times it can be more about like the authenticity of something that we're seeing. So I came across this TikTok, wanted to share it with you. Hopefully the audio is good. All right, Harry, what do you want for breakfast? I want strawberries. That's fine, but these are the last ones. Tastes like strawberries. That's because they are strawberries. I want more berries. Okay, like I said, that's the last of them. Um, do you want any watermelon? I don't like watermelon. I want more berries. No more berries. More berries. No berries. More. No. More. Harry, if you say berries, I'm going to lose it. Berries. Ah! <laughs> I love it. I think students would love it. Um, what is super fascinating is uh, the way in which this video was built. And luckily, TikToker Nick um, gave us the behind the scenes of how he built this video. And I want to show you the behind the scenes. You all asked for it. Here's the behind the scenes on how I created my Harry Styles deepfake video that went insanely viral. First, I listened to Watermelon Sugar until I found some words that I could make into a conversation. Then I filmed myself doing both sides of that conversation. To get the source data for Harry's face, I downloaded a bunch of interviews and put those into my deepfake program. Then I also added the first video that I filmed. The program ran for a week and mashed our faces together about 800,000 times until it spit out this creation. 
I cleaned it up and edited the face onto my original video and this is the result. Let me know in the comments what you thought of the video and if you want to see more like this because... Okay, one... You all asked for it. Here People are so freaking creative and talented. That's what I think of every time I watch this video. This is so entertaining. Um, I think, I know my own teenagers would find this incredibly entertaining. And there's a lot of really cool technology that lets people make really entertaining content. But sometimes this Here, you all asked for it. All right, Harry, what do you want for breakfast? On how I created my Harry Styles deep fake. We're done with you, Harry. No more. Um, sometimes <laughs> these same technologies um, can be used in ways that aren't just for entertainment. And so we have to kind of ask ourselves, what are, what are some other ways that this technology could be utilized? And why is it important for us to be able to spot, say, a deep fake like the one we just watched? You're about to see a small clip from a full like eight minute film that you can find on YouTube and that I have um, I have curated for you. It's called In Event of Moon Disaster. The beginning of the film um, begins with footage from the uh, space shuttle launch to the moon. And it talks about, you know, how excited everyone was for the for the astronauts to go to the moon. It gives a little, you know, clip of the Buzz Aldrin, one step for man, blah, blah, blah. And then it sort of cuts and says, um, you know, President Nixon actually prepared two speeches for this event. He prepared a speech for, uh, you know, what would happen if there was a successful moon landing. And that was the speech that was broadcast on television. But he also prepared a speech for what would happen if there had been a moon disaster. And the Library of Congress has that speech and the Library of Congress had that footage. And this footage is now being released for people to see. And the clip that you're about to watch is that footage. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. These brave men, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin, know that there is no hope for their recovery. But they also know that there is hope for mankind in their sacrifice. Okay, so the question is, how legitimate is this film in event of moon disaster? And you can find more about this film at moondisaster.org. I'm actually gonna go off script again here and just pop it open for us. So the video that you find on YouTube, it does just kind of sit on YouTube, but it's also housed here at moondisaster.org. Um, and it has been designed as an educational tool to help you spot deep fake technologies. And so we are able to watch the entirety of the film. Um, and then I can't show us the whole film, but after the film, we get all sorts of quiz questions. Questions like, is the, um, is the speech itself real true or false and that is true the library of congress does have the written out um in case of disaster speech and the the document itself the written words very real it asks um is nixon's face real and the answer is no um that video that we were watching was a compilation of you know other uh, Nixon speeches, sort of like we saw with Harry Styles, you know, where a computer was able to sort of put together this image of Nixon delivering a speech. Uh, was his voice real? The answer was no. This was technology, um, you know, reading the, the written word speech and being morphed into Nixon's voice. And so, uh, oh, here's the interactive behind the scenes. Um, kind of talks people through how it was created. There's a lot of uh, kind of interactive quiz questions down at the end, additional like 
you know, training clips, the actor performance. And so this interactive is a really cool way to learn about deep fakes. And so again, the question for our digital citizens is, you know, can we sort of recognize that all information, all media is, is created and it's created for different purposes. And the technology that we have allows us to create some really cool, uh, you know, pieces of entertainment, but it can also be used in some kind of dangerous ways. If we're thinking about rewriting history, look at how easy it is to do so. Um, if we have folks that are really engaged in conspiratorial thinking and who believe that the moon landing never happened and that it was all a government hoax. Here we've got a little clip that proves, right, that the moon landing was all a government hoax. And so we need our students to be wary uh, consumers. But I also think that we need all of us and our students to be thinking about how we can appeal to um, you know, groups like the FCC and uh, all of these different tech platforms that will put bigger systems and structures in place to keep our information landscape um, sort of clean of, of this type of content. So if your students are interested in deep fakes and want to learn more, the Moon Disaster is a great place to do that. Two of my other favorite websites checking our time, our witchfaceisreal.com and spotdeepfakes.org. Spot Deep Fakes is a, an educational website that kind of goes through different steps and asks people to uh, answer questions and provides, um, provides that education. Which Face is Real is a very interesting site that is starting to generate um, faces using computers. And this website is actually helping to train the algorithm. Um, if you go there, I've never been presented with the same face twice. You have to choose of these two photographs, which one is a real face, an actual photograph versus a computer generated face. Now I've done this quite a bit and I think I'm getting a little bit better at it. I say that now, but I'm going to click and get it wrong. I think this face is real. Ah, and I was right. Um, I'm going to go with this face is real. And you're like, wow, Kristen, like how, these both look pretty real. How did you get so good at it? Um, up here in the learn section, there is a really great tutorial about how to spot fake faces using that power of observation. Again, we have to slow down and teach our kids to really look and observe. Um, but there are common problems that are happening with computer generated faces and things that the algorithm just kind of struggles with. And when we can pick up on them and recognize them, it's like, you know, buying a red car and suddenly you see red cars everywhere. Once somebody's let you in on the secret, you can definitely see the mistakes. So another great uh, source to learn about uh, computer generated images. All right. You know, it's a good session when we got this many tabs open. Let's go back. <laughs> Let's go back here to the slides. All right, so video is tricky. Um, you know, we learned about reverse image searching a little bit, but how can we get context of video like the one we saw on Facebook? Or how can we get context of like that moon disaster video? Is there a reverse search for that? And one of my favorite tools, um, and I actually just found out this company has a, a TikTok as well. And so if you're on TikTok, go find them. Uh, their, their name is Invid, I-N-V-I-D, and they have so many cool videos that show you how they use their tool uh, to kind of figure some things out, but I digress. All right, so here we've got something very similar to what we were looking at with the storm in Sydney. It's another Facebook post, uh, November 16, 2018, but instead of a picture this time, this is an actual video, a 54 second video. And this person is claiming, wow, this is happening right now in California. And you can see it's been viewed 20 million times. 
it's been shared all over the place. And so if I'm in California, I'm looking for real, like up-to-date information on the situation at hand. I might see a Twitter live stream. I might see a Facebook video. I might catch somebody's Instagram story and take that in as information that's going to help me make decisions. Um, but again, the question is, is this accurate? So Invid is a browser extension that has a lot of really cool built-in tools. And like most tools, there is a free version and a paid version. I can barely handle all the stuff on the free version because it's so awesome. Um, so check out the free version. If you want to get it for your browser, you can go to weverify.eu or you can simply go to the Chrome web store and search for Invid. They did have a version for Safari, um, but they are working on updating their tools and their first update was released to Chrome. So the most up-to-date version of this will be for Google Chrome. When you launch Invid, you have an entire toolbox at your disposal that can help you be a really cool CSI digital citizen. Um, tools for video, for images, and also some data analysis. And when I plug the Facebook video into Invid, and again, with this video analysis tool, I can, I, I'm not going to do it live, um, but you can click on video analysis and you can uh, pop the URL right into video analysis. It can be a YouTube video, Facebook, or Twitter. When you plug it in, um, Invid will actually scan the entirety of the, I think it was like a six minute video, and they will pull key frames out of that video. So key points in time um, and sort of lay them out as still images, then automatically Invid will reverse image search each one of those key frames, asking this question, where have these frames appeared on the internet before? So it's like a reverse image search, but for video. And much like the Google search results page that we got that kind of showed us all the different places where we could find the picture of the Pantages Theater, we get all of these results of places where this video has appeared before on the internet. So you'll see that this particular video was first found on December 6th, 2017. It was, it appeared on a whole bunch of web pages. I just grabbed a screenshot of like the top three results. But essentially, this video is another example of a false context where we had someone taking a very real, um, you know, video like the Facebook voting video and claiming a different context for it. So a different time period, a different location. Um, so the video itself, the footage is real, but the context was wrong. So this video is actually from a California uh, fire that happened in 2017. There we go. Repurposed, false context, a form of misinformation. So let's take a look at some more of the capabilities that Invid has, because it isn't just this reverse video searching capability. Um, here's a claim. Tom Hanks, actor we all know and love, has started wearing political t-shirts. Maybe you've seen some of these pictures floating around the internet. I know I personally saw that one on the left, the science is real, Black Lives Matter, love is love. And I'm like, oh, that's a pretty cool shirt. I wonder if I could buy that shirt somewhere. I, I know I've seen that shirt and had that thought. Um, I did not see these other two shirts until I did a little Google searching, but um, essentially, you know, the claim is that Tom Hanks is walking around as like a political billboard. Now, what Invid can do is take an image like this first Tom Hanks image and do a heat map over the top of the image. Now, I'm not as tech savvy as I would like to be to fully explain this, but the way that I understand it is that when we save a file, our computer compresses that file to, to make the, the file that lives on our computer. Now, when I open up that file and I modify it using a, a tool like Photoshop, and then I save it again, the pieces that have been modified have to be compressed a, a second time. It's, it's, 
it's saving the new contents in that file. So what Invid does is it draws this heat map and it highlights these hot spots that have likely been modified. And they're identifying how many times that that piece of the file has been sort of compressed. Like, hey, this piece has been compressed more than once. Odds are it has been changed or modified at some point in time. And in fact, that Tom Hanks shirt has been modified lots of times because doing a reverse image search of that, you know, that shirt I wanted to buy, I found Tom Hanks in this same sort of selfie pose wearing lots of different shirts. Um, the original is on the far right. He's actually wearing, it looks like a soccer jersey. Okay, so running that uh, other 9-11 t-shirt through the Invid uh, tool, I see, sure enough, that piece of the shirt just, you know, lit up hot on the map. It's a, an indicator that something may be amiss here. So it's just another way for us to either confirm a suspicion or maybe look deeper into something that the tool is tipping us off on. Not an exact science, but another clue for us. There's that one running through Invis heat maps. And I think the moral of the story is like, if you're Tom Hanks, don't go outside in a plain white t-shirt because the internet is going to have its way with you. That's, that's the moral of the story for me. <laughs> Okay, so with students, oftentimes it can be hard to practice these strategies um, when parts of our internet are maybe locked down, um, or we might have a piece of media that we want kiddos to investigate, but it can be hard to like get that media to them to start the investigation. So I wanted to just show you one way that I approach it. Um, with, with young people, I will often download an image into my Google Drive. I will download a TikTok and save it into my Google Drive. I'll download something from YouTube and save it into my Google Drive. And instead of pointing kids toward, you know, the TikTok URL, which is likely going to be blocked, um, I point them toward that file in my Google Drive. So a couple ways that I did that just for all of you, if you want to try your hand at some of these forensic tools, um, you can give a QR code that links there. And then my absolute favorite new tool that I learned about recently at a conference is Yelkey. And Yelkey is a URL shortener that allows us to take a big long URL and decide how long we want it to remain active. So all I did was take my uh, little Google Drive uh, link here of Hannah and pop it into the Yell key and created a shortcut just for all of you that I made live for 24 hours. And it's always yellkey.com slash, just some really simple like three or four letter word. So you can all get there right now using yellkey.com slash box. If you wanna play around and see what you can find out about Hannah and the butterflies. Uh, I did it before our session too. So yellkey.com slash onto is also gonna give you access to that photograph. So again, not a perfect science, but a possible way to get students some content that they can do a little bit of forensics investigation on uh, and get around some of those uh, filters and blocks that you might experience at school. All right, just to close us off, I want to share with you a resource that um, I'm, I'm going to point you to my big Wakelet page because every presentation that I do has a Wakelet board. And I also just have lots of other Wakelet boards around all sorts of digital citizenship topics. So wakelet.com slash at Dr. K Masson is going to take you to my main profile page. And I will give you the exact link to the Wakelet for this particular session. Um, I think if I put it in the chat for my panelists, they can pass it on to you via YouTube, I think. Um, but again, if you just go to my Wakelet board, you'll see one there for digital forensics. Uh, finally, I would like to invite you to just keep touch with me through our mailing list. Uh, bit.ly slash edvolvemail22. Again, the capital E and the capital M have to be capitalized. Uh, I really suck at email lists and often forget to email people. But if I ever launch a fun new resource or um, 
you know, have something interesting I want to share, it's always through my email list. So promise not to spam you mostly because I stink at email lists. But if you want to keep up to date with me and uh, all things digital citizenship, feel free to jump on that email list. We have just about two or three minutes left. So I wanted to check in with Ryan and Tamara and see if there were any questions or comments that were coming in during the session that I might be able to answer before logging out. So one of the big things, um, one, uh, I remember hearing about deep fake technology a few years ago, but the fact that it has, I mean, those are crazy. Exploded. Both of those videos, they, it, it, it has, it has exploded and just taken off. Um, yeah. And then I also had uh, that song stuck in my head and I've been like tapping it out on our- Sorry, our not here. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. It's a good song. It's a catchy one. It is. Um, but just the fact that, so to at the beginning, you said like, let's zoom out. Let's look at the whole picture and take in all of the information and then let's zoom into it. So once we have an idea of where the picture was taken, then we can actually zoom into the details to really get a better idea of what's going on. Um, I think that's really important for our kids to know, but also us as adults too. For sure, for sure. And I think that I learned that, I learned that this week, like just being part of that Facebook marketplace scam, um, zooming in and just looking really closely at that email. I, I had some kind of gut feelings, but I wasn't really sure. And it did, it, take, it took that zooming out and really looking at, um, you know, some articles that I was reading, actually jumping into my Zelle account and being like, are there even any transactions going on here that I need to be aware of? And then zooming back in and going, oh, yep, the article said this or this would be part of the scam. And sure enough, that is in the email. And so it is this cyclical process. Um, and I think just all of us can slow down um, for sure and trust our gut a little bit when it comes to, to information. Can I get the shout out before we go? Absolutely. I'm going to give a shout out because um, I don't think this is on my wakelet board, but it's, you know, it's good. It's a good shout out. Um, I want to shout out the authors of this book, um, Jennifer Lagarde and Darren Hudgens. They are ISTE authors, librarians. They wrote Developing Digital Detectives. And this book is a really great tool to help young people tune into like their gut feelings and their emotions as they work through information literacy tasks. So it's a super nice tie into some of the things that we talked about here today and crossing over with some of our SEL goals. And this book is just jam packed full of uh, really practical lessons that you can bring into your classroom. So if this is exciting to you, check out their work too. Yes, we've, um, we love Jennifer Lagarde and everything that she puts They're out awesome. as well. It, um, it makes it the activities that they have, um, and some of the ones that you talked about today, it's so easy to teach our kids to do these things, but it's not a, it's not something that we are born knowing to do. It's definitely something, it, it's a skill set that has to be taught. Um, For sure. and so using some of the activities that you did today, um, it, it helps. I think our teachers kind of like, okay. Like I'm not recreating the wheels. Someone, yep. there are there are activities out there that I can already use to to teach my kids how to become better digital detectives. Yeah, for sure. I love it. Yeah. Um, and I think like you and I as as intelligent adults, we kind of do some of this automatically, but to have to break it down and teach it to a non-expert can be hard. Um yes. but to have like actual steps that we can give to kids, I think is really helpful. Yeah, and then I think that game, um, it, it took me back to uh, where in the world is Geo Guesser, yeah. Geo, <laughs> where you just are dropped on a map and you have to figure out where you are. That would be, I think that would just be a fun game. It's, it's a little addicting. That, I, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I remember playing Carmen San Diego all the time and it was mm -hmm. like, oh, this is fun. Well, yeah. we use that in the social studies classroom and um, all that one and all the other fun tools that you showed could be put in lessons for sure students because we have a hard time like getting that across to students but bringing up these fun games and websites mm -hmm. and extensions that you have 
uh, shown us, that will be amazing for teachers to just kind of trick the kids into learning. About <laughs> yeah. And when you can tie it into your content area, it's so much more valuable, right? So if I find a piece of science misinformation, or if I'm finding a, a weird infographic, making a claim about a math concept, I can, I can be a detective on that information. So absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so, so much oh, for joining us you. this morning. Um, we were kind of talking, uh, we noticed that it's like 20 something degrees where you are. So it made us really thankful to be sitting in like the eighties. Yes. <laughs> I have a space heater under my desk right now. <laughs> so yeah, it's not warm, but I'll try my best to stay warm and you all enjoy your sunshine. <laughs> yes. And have a wonderful day. Thank you thank again you. so much. Yes, you too. You. Bye all. Bye. All right, guys, we are going to take a short break. Um, this is would be a really good time to go get some coffee. Um, we are water drinkers, so we need to go fill up water bottles. Um, well, I mean, I had my coffee this morning. Did you have yours? I did. Yeah, I had to. of course, of course. Um, so go take care of whatever you need to. Um, and then we will be back here on the hour starting at 10. And we're going to be looking at some wonderful apps with our very own Tashana Wardsworth Thomas from Hopper Middle School. So y'all come back here in about five-ish minutes and we'll be coming back at you with another great session. Welcome to EdTech Live. We're happy that you're here today. I'm Tamara and this is Ryan. We would like to take a moment and welcome you to today's event and give you a little information about what to expect. New sessions start every hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of personal needs. During the live event, you also have two sessions each hour to choose from. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. During each session, the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link you use to access the attendance forms and you will enter the code onto the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you will have to do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit if you are watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting your attendance, you should be receiving a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, please resubmit the attendance form and double check to make sure your email address is typed correctly. We, along with our whole EdTech team, want to thank you again for being here today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon. If you don't have a monitor and you would like to split your screen, the steps are simple. Simply click the Windows button and the left and right arrow on your keyboard. You can also go up and down if you so choose. I'm going to do that now. I can repeat the process on the other window and have split my screen. Sometimes you get the option to be able to choose. I've split my screen to the right, and now I need to tell them what I would like to put on the left. Those are the steps of splitting your screen on a Windows device. Welcome to EdTech Live. We're happy that you're here today. I'm Tamara and this is Ryan. We would like to take a moment and welcome you to today's event and give you a little information about what to expect. 
New sessions start every hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of personal needs. During the live event, you also have two sessions each hour to choose from. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. During each session, the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link you use to access the attendance forms and you will enter the code onto the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you will have to do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit if you are watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting your attendance, you should be receiving a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, please resubmit the attendance form and double check to make sure your email address is typed correctly. We, along with our whole EdTech team, want to thank you again for being here today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon. If you don't have a monitor and you would like to split your screen, the steps are simple. Simply click the Windows button and the left and right arrow on your keyboard. You can also go up and down if you so choose. I'm going to do that now. I can repeat the process on the other window and have split my screen. Sometimes you get the option to be able to choose. I've split my screen to the right and now I need to tell them what I would like to put on the left. Those are the steps of splitting your screen on a Windows device. All right, welcome back everybody. We are happy to have you joining us again for our second session of this EdTech Live. Connie, who do we have coming up next? You know who we have? We have Dr. I mean, Doc, I'm sorry. She's probably true, but Tashana Woodsworth Thomas. She's an amazing librarian over at Hopper Middle School. She does so much fun stuff with her kids. And I know she's gonna have some great ideas for you guys. Um, she became a media specialist just to help teachers teach teachers how to be better with their kids and technology. Yes, and I know, um, Tashana, I see you sharing out so much stuff on Twitter all the time. Um, I wish I could be like in your library all the time because it's just so fun and it it, I, I'm kind of jealous. I know, I know. I want to go over there, do more stuff with you. Well, you can drop by next week. We're making ornaments with books in them. So, okay, those are my favorite kind of books. Yes, so I'll be there. Count me in. All right, Tashana, whenever you are ready, um, I'm going to go ahead and send it over to you. And we are excited to learn more about some apps and tools that we can use in our classrooms with our students. All right. So today we're going to have happy hour. And if you want to, can you see me? I think I lost everybody. Nope, you're good. Okay. So today we're going to learn some apps. Um, if you want to tweet out, I'm Mrs. Um, WWT at Hopper Middle School. So we're going to just cover a few things. Let's begin now. Mm -hmm. So the first couple of apps that I want to cover is going to be Adobe. So I absolutely love Adobe and my teachers have fun doing it. And I put a few um, little things inside our presentation. So when we do Adobe, we're gonna learn how to export PDFs um, to Microsoft Office or Excel, make a fillable PDF and how to password protect the PDF. So let me give you a disclaimer. First, if you're troubleshooting, make sure you have Adobe Creative Cloud downloaded through Avanti if you're inside there. And it looks a little bit like this. And so we just wanna make sure you have that. You will need your text help to put in the code. And my second disclaimer is a lot of teachers have trouble when they're opening a PDF. You always wanna make sure if you're going to edit or do anything, you right click 
and you're going to edit with Adobe Acrobat. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to share this presentation at the end. And if you click on the links, I have folders with samples so that and small videos, so you'll be able to use those things. So a lot of times I have teachers coming to me with the district have PowerPoints that they've turned into PDFs because it's too large to share a PowerPoint. And so I'm gonna go to my desktop and I'm gonna open this PowerPoint. And so I'm gonna right click on this PowerPoint. It's a, well, PDF. And I'm going to, and it's in PowerPoint form already. But when I put it in PDF, it kind of squishes it up and makes it easier to just email. So I'm gonna go to tools. And I'm going to go to export. And I'm gonna do it to PowerPoint. And I love this because it just turns it straight from the PDF right into PowerPoint form. Um, in the past, I would have to copy and paste it into pictures. And it takes a couple of minutes. It's fairly quick in converting it. Um, I shared this with my teachers and they absolutely loved it. They're like, oh, I've been spending a lot of time changing it to PowerPoint and I'm like, nope, it's so easy. And it's all there in your PowerPoint form and you can just present it as is. Um, I hope this makes it easier for you. And guys, this is my first time doing um, EdTech Live. So I'm going back and forth and I don't see anybody and trying to see. Um, our next one is we're going to create a fillable PDF. A lot of times you have applications or worksheets or things that you want to change to a PDF. And so what we're going to do is show you how to do it. It's super easy. There are two steps that you can easily get tripped up on. And so I downloaded an application from Microsoft Word. So the first thing I want to do is look at it and check, okay, this is what I would like to do. I want to use everything in here. If not, I can edit and cut anything I want out. I'm going to right click on it. And the very first thing I'm going to do is convert it to Adobe PDF. Hey, Tashana. So, yes. Well, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I am... Um... We are seeing your presentation. We're not seeing actually what you're doing. Okay. That's what I was trying to figure out because I just, it's like I'm disappeared. So, so do you have multiple screens? I have one screen. Okay. Now I see your desktop. Okay. I see your Bitmoji classroom. It's very cute. Okay. So did y'all see the export to PDF? No, ma'am. We did not. Okay. All we were right. trying to figure out like, hmm, I think we're supposed to be seeing some clicking and something like that, so. Okay, so here you should see, you see everything here. I see your presentation, yes, ma'am. Okay, and so now you see my desktop? Yes, ma'am. Perfect, okay, so let's go back. Yay, okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. And it, it worked very differently when we tested it. So we're gonna export to a PowerPoint. So this is a PDF. And so we're opening it and then we're gonna to go to our tools. Okay, I have two, hold on. This is my export to PDF. We're gonna open it. And you can see everything, right? Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and open it and edit it. Go to our tools. 
And when we click on our tools, we're gonna export the PDF. And so if you wanna do Excel, Microsoft, or we wanna do this in PowerPoint, we're gonna go ahead and export it. And it's gonna say that we've already done it because I did it and you couldn't see it. And so we wanna go ahead and do it again. And when it opens up in PowerPoint, it's gonna be just in the same format as a PowerPoint. You're not gonna to have to do any adjustments. Um, this is one way when people send you files in PDF that is a PowerPoint because they're too large to send via email, they put them in PDF. And so you can go ahead and present now from this PowerPoint. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back to my presentation. We're gonna create a fillable PDF. And I'm checking my green box to make sure I'm showing you guys everything. And so I have this Word document here. And the first thing I'm gonna do is right click it. And I'm gonna convert it to a PDF. And so when I convert it to a PDF, I'm gonna save it. And it's gonna to save to my desktop as a PDF. And once it's a PDF, then I'm gonna make sure that I right click and open it. I'm gonna go ahead and close it because you notice at the top, you don't see your tools to edit. So I'm gonna right click and edit it. So I'm gonna, you see your tools here. I'm gonna click on my tools. I'm gonna go down to prepare the form and start. And so you'll see that it is now turning it into a fillable PDF. And so if you preview it, you would see blue windows. Now, sometimes mine does it perfectly. And sometimes what I have to do is save it and close out. And then when I go back in, it is a fillable PDF. I'm gonna type a two in front of it. And so when I open it up, you're gonna see the blue links, which means that it is now a fillable PDF. Super easy. Um, I had a lot of people saying, how long do I have to go in and type in all of these things? If you want to create your very own fillable PDF by just creating links inside of it, you can. It's gonna take you a lot longer than to create a Word document and turn it into a PDF and then create your fillable PDF. And last but not least, I want to protect my PDF. Um, a lot of times we can pull PDFs off the internet and use them and adjust them and change them. But you know, I tell my kids, once it's out on the web, it no longer belongs to you. Um, one of the ways to make sure that you can keep what belongs to you yours is to right click on your PDF. Again, you're gonna edit with Adobe Acrobat. Okay. I'm gonna go to my tools. And I'm gonna scroll down and I'm going to protect this um, document. So when I share it with others, I can put a password on it and they can only print it or view it or however I want them to do it. And so I'm gonna put my password in. It's gonna be Philip, which is my puppy. 
and I can only make them view it or edit if they have the password. And again, there are some advanced options as far as encrypting, but I'm not good at that. So I'm just gonna show you the simple things on protecting using the password. And it'll tell me like my password is weak um, and try to get you to change it. But if that's, you know, you just want an easy password because you're sharing with your coworkers. Um, I absolutely love Adobe PDF. Um, I use it to change when I'm in a meeting and they send a PDF of an Excel file. I use it and go in and edit things. Um, are there any questions, Ryan? Okay, all right. So I hope this is making it easy. Now, I wanna share with you that in the event that your Adobe PDF is not working and you need a PDF right away, I'm gonna take you to a site, it's called PDF Candy. And it's free. You can purchase a subscription, but all of the tools are free for you to use online. And so as you can see, you can go ahead and change and convert the PDF to a Word document, Excel, and other items. Now, I am going to tell you this little disclaimer that PDF Candy extension is not approved by the district. Um, you can use it without adding the extension, but it's blocked by admin. So make sure um, you can use it on your personal device um, if you need to use it instead of your Adobe. Now, the other thing about Adobe is I want to share with you is that you can add Adobe to one of your personal devices. And so you'll get with your tech and find out how to add it on. And with the PDF candy, you can do all the same things that you can do with Adobe. So if you don't have your Creative Cloud updated and you need that PDF, you can go ahead and do it. You can protect it. Um, it does have some additional features like um, watermarking it, um, converting to a JPEG. You can merge and cut the document in half and delete pages. So. I use this if there's an event that I cannot get my Adobe Creative Cloud working. Now, I'm gonna take off my tech hat and I'm gonna put on my librarian hat. And I'm gonna share with you one of our um, apps, Sora. It is available through the district. Um, it's in your my.cfisd under library resources. And this has tons of books. It has professional books children's books, all of those books. And so it is an app that you can share with your own personal kids, your kids at work. And um, if you're in school and you're looking for some PD, there are tons of PD books here available for you to check out. It is just like the regular library. It's about 10 to 13 days to check out a book there are audio books available for you. Um, so let's do a little bit of exploring. We do have books that are always available. Our district has been so kind to allow us to purchase several copies of the infamous Diary of a Wimpy Kid um, so that that book is always available to kids who want to read it. Um, we do have audio books as well as regular eBooks. And so when you click on a book, it'll tell you whether it's a juvenile book if you're using it with your students, or it'll tell you if it's a middle school book or a high school book. Now, kids can only see books at their level. So elementary kids aren't seeing high school books. And so you as the teacher will see a variety of different books. So if you're gonna sh share books with your kids, make sure that your kids can see these books. And you can borrow the book. Um, the beautiful thing I like about it is I can make a list of like our Blue Bonnet books. And as I read them, I can have them 
there in the queue and I can share with kids, oh, I finished this book. Um, if you're a reading teacher, you can have kids click on the book and say, okay, you finished the book. How long did it take you to read the book? And so it will tell you, you can add it to the whole, if I click on the book, sometimes it'll tell me, oh, you've only had this book open for 36 minutes. And so kids love to um, tell you, I finished the book. One of the new features that happened in the last couple of years is our students that are dyslexic. Um, there is a dyslexic font and we can change some of the language of the directions, not the actual books, but change the directions for the kids um, to use some of those books. It'll tell you um, books that are on hold, books that um, you have checked out. And as you can see, I have a book that's due in 11 hours and I am not done with it. Um, you can put books on hold and it'll tell you about how long. So if there's a book you're wanting to do a lesson and you, um, they don't have it in your library, you wanna go ahead and put it on hold. If you click on the little clock, it'll tell you how long and how many copies and how many people are waiting before you get that book. And if that book comes available or you change ideas, you can cancel the whole. So I absolutely love Sora. Um, and like I shared in site there, our Sora books are divided into four categories, our elementary, our middle, high school, and our professional books. And you can keep them to about 10 to 20 days, depending on the book. There are audiobooks available. And in the past, I know some people um, talk about how we used to connect it with Harris County Public Library. We can no longer do that, but you can check out um, Harris County Public Library Libby program. And so it'll double the books. Are there any questions? No? Okay. So I want to talk about Microsoft Stream. Um, to me, Microsoft Stream kind of gets lost between WeVideo and Screencastify. I know this year I did a lot, last year I did a lot of Screencastify videos. And this year I logged in and it says, you have too many videos. And so I was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? And so um, Microsoft Stream gives you actually 15 minutes of recording. And what I like about Microsoft Stream is that I can go into my videos, I can create them from Microsoft Stream, I can make a whole channel that my kids can go to where all the videos are housed. And I can actually look and search. Anybody in the district who's made some videos, um, and that's what I like. So if you're looking for something and you're like, I wanna see if there's a video already out there. Um, as you can see, Ryan has made a video and, um, and we can go in and look at her videos and see if that's something we wanna use. So one important thing I wanna tell you about Microsoft Stream, yes, it gives you 15 minutes, um, but the key to Microsoft Stream is you have to make it visible if you don't, I actually decided, oh no, I didn't want anybody to see my video, just my kids. Um, when I clicked on it and took it down to make it private, the kids couldn't view the video. So you just have to be careful um, that you make it public. You can edit the name of your video. Um, you can only share your video with certain people if you would like to. And like I said, I can create a channel. I have not used it as a channel and housed all my videos there because I was making tons of um, Screencastify videos. And so what I do is I make many videos to go inside my presentations and I'm able to download those videos and upload them into my presentation. And that's kind of why some of these aren't published. Oh, 
have a question so far? Okay. If I'm going too fast, let me know. All right, so I'm gonna skip on over to Kahoot and I'm gonna save Lens for last because I'm gonna have to plug up my hover cam. And so the kids absolutely love Kahoot. Um, my favorite thing is when I, when they walk in and they hear the music, they love it. They're like, oh, what are we doing today? And so I forgot to log in before today's session. Oh no, it's not letting me log in. Now guys, this is my first time not pre presenting in person. So it is. Um, I mean, things happen with tech, right? We have a love-hate relationship yeah. with it. We love it when it works and we hate it when it doesn't. Yep. And <laughs> Just it's relax, not, you'll get it. There's no way we log in. I'm in. Okay, so it should, yes, is it not gonna let me log in? Continue for free. And it's funny because everything works. I practiced yesterday with my husband and he's like, are you sure you wanna practice before you leave? I'm like, I have it, I have it. Uh, one of the fun things that I do um, with my kids my seventh and eighth graders, I do a fun Kahoot with library orientation. And so they don't get the long, full one hour presentation of where things are in the library if they've already been here. I um, do a little Kahoot to see what they know and what they don't remember about the library and any changes that I've made to the library. And so what I do is I start the game. And if everybody gets the game wrong, the question wrong, I'll say, hey, guys, let's stop and talk about it. And we'll go over some things that they missed. It's a great way to know what you need to reteach. And like I said, I'm the librarian, not the classroom teacher and cl classroom teachers would use it differently. And so I try to integrate it into um, the library. And so we just start the game with our little join code. And we have a class set of iPads in the library that we use. And the kids will log in and we'll start. And they'll say it's waiting for players and I have no players. So if anybody wants to join, that's our game pin. You can go ahead and join. At least one player, please join so I can show a sample. And you hear the little music in the background and the kids hear the music and they absolutely love it. No players. We are typing in your game pin right now, Tashana. Okay. Okay. Okay, we have one participant. Yay! And then and I'm gonna go ahead and start it.
I feel like I'm breaking up. Can you hear me clearly, Ryan? Yes, ma'am, we hear you loud and clear. Okay. So let's go ahead and start the game. All right, so I always start and ask the kids, what do you think the library hours are? And so they'll say, um, you're always open, you're before school, after school, and then, is it frozen? Am I frozen? Oh, here we go. Nope, oh, there we are. All right, we have the, we have the cocoon up on our, oh let's see, library hours. Goodness. Okay, let me stop sharing for a minute. Okay, my whole purpose for coming to the school was to make sure that I would not have any internet issues. I don't think it's just you though. Okay. Okay, are we there? I'm yes. not frozen. Okay, perfect. All right, so the kids get to check and see what time the library hours are. And so if you'll go ahead and pick an answer. And then it'll stop and it'll say the library is open from 7.50 to 3.30 because we may not have any after school activities. And so I will stop and reteach the question before I go on to the next question. And Allison is in the lead. And at the very end of the game, um, it does give you the top three winners. And that's what I absolutely love about it. And Ryan, do I need to stop to do a code for attendance? Um, how about after this Kahoot game, we do our attendance? Does that sound good? Okay. And so once we make it to the very end of all of our questions, it will give me a, um, hold on, my lights are blinking. Oh my God, I'm having all kinds of issues today. Our lights kept turning on and off earlier, Tashana. You were totally good. So we understand. We're waiting for them yeah. to turn off again on us. <laughs> um, and I've already warned Connie, like, I won't be able to keep a straight face during that. I'm just going <laughs> to, you know. What and the whole I'm purpose having connection issues on my computer, so it's not you. Yeah, the whole purpose, I'm like, okay, I'll go to the school today. I won't have to worry about internet issues. I won't have to worry about my husband or the dog. I'll go to the school. It's just me. And so it's been fun. Um, so at the end of Kahoot, it'll give you the top three winners. And what I usually do then is award the those three kids a prize. They either get um, something from my treasure chest or the infamous candy that my principal don't tell her that I will give them a, a candy prize or they can check out an extra book. And so that's the fun thing about Kahoot is that you don't have to, it's just kind of a, a test of what the kids already know. Awesome, so let's go ahead, excuse me, and do our um, attendance real quick. So uh, remember, get out the pencil and paper or write down uh, on a Google doc, write down this code. The code for this session is our, H-O-U-R, make sure you spell it correctly. And then type in those bit.ly's. Remember bit.ly is case sensitive. So go ahead, type in that bit.ly. Um, if you are in districts, if you are in CFISD, the CFISD is capitalized. If you are joining us from outside of CFISD, welcome. We're happy to have you here. Um, in order to get that credit, the at the end of the bit.ly, the visitor is capitalized as well. So again, write down the secret code. The secret code is hour for happy hour because we're learning so much about apps during this session. Um, and then we're going to turn it back over to Tashana. Um, and so we can continue learning some more great apps. 
Okay. Let me go and share my screen. My um have my staff telling me that my my screen name is now my um employee ID. I'm like, I can't change it. All right, so Flipgrid, and I know a lot of people um, probably know a lot about Flipgrid. I use it a lot in the library. I have library assistants, and so they practice answering the, the phone. And so my kiddos, um, they actually record themselves answering the phone because as the librarian, I, it's just me. And so if I'm teaching a class and they're calling because they need a kid or different things, um, the student assistants answer the phone. And it's so great that when they call and they said, who answered the phone? They really did a great job. And so I said, well, they got to practice. And so all of my kids get to practice. They record themselves. It's one of their daily grades answering the phone. Um, in the summer, I've been allowed the opportunity to teach coding. And so at the end of my session, I go and I have the kids record a video of how, what they enjoyed about the class and anything, any type of message they want to share with me about what we can do better for the class. And so I use it and the kids come in and they'll say, oh, I really like this class. I wish this would have happened in the class. And so um, it's a great tool to get feedback. Um, as a teacher, a lot of times we don't like to get feedback from the kids, but I find it important to get that feedback from the kids to find out, okay, how is it that I can make this more interesting from them? And so at the end of my semester with my student assistants, they will record a video and share what they enjoyed about the class um, what they didn't like about the class and anything that they would like me to change. And so some of those suggestions um, I've taken. So my kids get PBIS points for showing up to work in the library. And so they're able to buy things like homework passes from me because they have assignments that they do. They go to different offices and they get to use those passes to purchase a different office pass. And so when I get that feedback at the end of the semester, I kind of watch those videos and I'm able to say, okay, these are some changes that I can make for um, next semester. Is there any questions? Now, one of the things that I really love about Flipgrid is when I go um, to the kids, I make their videos private. So that means other kids can't see their video. The only person that can see their video is me. And so I can put the directions, what the kids are supposed to do. And in my settings, they can respond. Um, I can make it where they can like other kids' videos or not other kids' videos, but when they're doing their recording for the assignment, I just make sure that it's private so that it's their grade and only me can see it. And it'll say video comments only, text comments, or I can take it in there, no comments at all. And then it'll say that the comments are hidden if I allow comments until I approve them. So that way other kids aren't on there saying things to other kids. Okay, and then I'm going to go over to Edpuzzle. And I actually love Edpuzzle. I don't use it as much um, because I started out using the videos and then the Google Forms because we didn't have a full subscription to Edpuzzle. And so now that we do, I'm going to go ahead and start sending my videos to Edpuzzle and embedding the quiz in Edpuzzle because 
there is a link in Schoology. And so it makes it very smooth when I'm going to go to my Schoology course. When I am adding this assignment, adding this assignment to Schoology, because the add puzzle button is there. So I'm going to go to my office assistance class. And if I am adding this assignment, I can add it with the Ed Puzzle button. And I absolutely love this because I can just click on it, add the student assistant video, the grades will come up in Ed Puzzle. And let me show you a course that. So what, let's go where? And I know y'all probably are thinking, oh my God, the library has assignments? Yes, we do. And so it'll give me the kids' names and their grades right there in Edpuzzle and I can start looking at, okay, what is it that we need to go over? How did you guys do? And so I absolutely love using Edpuzzle and I'm, I'm gonna do more Edpuzzles in the near future. There is a community of work and so again, one of my teachers were, was using one of the videos and then it became where the kids couldn't see it. So I'm gonna always ask you to check, have a student log in because a lot of times we can see it on our end, but on the kids end, they can't see it. And so before we put a lesson in, um, try to have a kid log in and see and test it before you can uh, post it. So I'm going to search a video on um, reading poetry. And so if I'm looking here, this teacher has a video and it has questions in it and I can use it, preview it, copy it to my content. And then I can go in and assign it to my kiddos. But of course, we always want to preview it before we assign it to their kiddo. Okay. So my last thing I want to show you today is Microsoft Lens. And to do so, I am going to have to plug up my Hevercam. Because how much time do we have, Ryan? Or Connie? You are good, Tashana. We've got about 10 minutes left. Okay. So I'm going to plug up my hover cam. And I am going to share my hover cam. <laughs> hover cam, please work. There it goes. Let's see, can you see, you can't see my hover cam yet, can you? Let's no, ma'am, not yet. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing and try to share it again. Open my Flex 11. What if instead of trying to share your screen to Shauna, you um, change your video output to the hover cam? That's what we're using right now is a hover cam. We like it. Okay, so let me change my video output to the hover cam. Yeah, let's try that in Zoom. Instead of trying to share your screen, 
Um, that way it'll just be your video that it's going to use will be your hover cam instead, like, like we're doing. Okay. There's no need to cart around this huge oh. camera. Just use a hover cam. <laughs> it's got a mic built in. It's got everything you need. For some reason, here we go. Let's change it to the hover cam. All right. Yeah, there we go. Well, we still okay. see your virtual background. We still okay. see your amazing office. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. It's got a pretty, yeah, yeah, yeah. there we go. Okay. So I'm going to use my iPad for um, Microsoft Lens. And I'm doing what I tell my kids never to do, never share your password. And so I am on the BYOT. Okay, so can you see me? Move it back. Okay, so here I have an Excel document of a ton of library books. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my hover cam, my lens, over this document and I'm just gonna take a picture. And so once I take a picture, I'm going to confirm the picture. Can you see it? It's blurry. Let's go a little closer. So it's gonna confirm the picture. Let's try it again. I'm gonna open Microsoft Lens. I'm gonna take a picture. I'm gonna confirm the picture. And it's actually gonna clean it up. So you can't really see it as well. So it's actually gonna clean this picture up. It's not gonna be as out of the box. I can rotate the picture around. and I can share it. I can write on top of it if I want, add a text. And it's gonna stay. I can share it. I can crop out different information. What I actually love about this is a lot of times if you're in a meeting and you just wanna take a picture and add your own notes, you can do that. So when I'm done, I can discard all the media. Now, I'm gonna take this same document. I want the text off of this to email. So I'm gonna, Hover over it. I'm going to take a picture of it. And it made it blurry. Let's try it again. I know you guys can't see very well this. I apologize for this because it worked before, but it's not as clean. I'm going to drag the box to get all of my information. Confirm it. And you can see that it's extracting the data from the table. And it's gonna give me the data in text form so that I can add or take away what I want. So if you look here, and I think it's back on for you. You can't, it's not mirroring, is it? No, we look, it, I see the text box down at the bottom with the um, information in it. Okay, so it has, it took all of that text and put it in text form. And so I can copy it or I can share it. 
And if I email it to myself, I can put it in a Word document. I can do whatever I want to. Do. And so that's one of the things about Microsoft Lens that is great. It will make a clean picture for you. So sometimes how you take a picture and it's kind of catawampus, it will make it clean and you can draw the edges where you want. It will take the text off the page and put it in a form that you can email so you can delete or um, add to what you want and then go ahead and put it in a new document. All righty. Any questions, Ryan? None? No, ma'am, but that app is awesome. Connie and I were just talking about how she uses that um, frequently to take pictures of like documents and stuff like that and then have it there so she can just quickly, you know, email it off and send it off if she needs to. Yeah, for both education and personal, there's a ton of things you can do with that. Thank you for showing it. Yeah, I like that. I might have to, I'm, Y'all know me, I'm a Google person. So anything that has Microsoft tacked onto it, I'm gonna have to work on. But I, I wanna try, I yes. wanna try using this. <laughs> we, will, we will get you over to the other side. You know, pull me to the dark side, <laughs> dark side of Microsoft. Oh goodness. Uh, well, Tashana, uh, do we have any more apps that you're gonna show us this hour? There are no more apps because the other app that I, I will add to the presentation is Microsoft Translator. You have a person doing that um, right now. And so the Bitly, I, I sent it to you, right? You did, All yes. right. So if you'll share the Bitly and they can have full access to the presentation. Wonderful. We are going, oh no, we're gonna go ahead and throw that into the YouTube chat here shortly. Um, Tashana, thank you so, so much for joining us this Saturday morning. We loved learning all of the different apps that you showed us. Um, and I'm excited to start using some of them more, especially uh, when you were talking about Sora. Oh, I love the fact that I can check out books and put them on hold and I can do it all from, you know, my couch because I'm a homebody and don't like it. I don't like going out to the world ever. <laughs> I don't. Yes, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you soon in your new in your library with all your fun stuff going on. Yes. Yeah. One of the things that I was doing today is putting the mini books inside the ornament. So this oh, is that yes. looks like so fun. Ornament. We need to go make some. Let's do it. Yes. So and I'll what day are you doing that? Out? We're doing it next week, Wednesday. Yeah. All righty. We, we'll see you then. Thank you. All right, guys. We will be back here shortly. Um, for our next session with Ms. Laura Dyer, joining us from Klein ISD. She is right down the road from us. Um, so come on back and we're going to be looking at some tools that you can use with your students so they can show you what they know. We'll be back shortly. Welcome to EdTech Live. We're happy that you're here today. I'm Tamara and this is Ryan. We would like to take a moment and welcome you to today's event and give you a little information about what to expect. New sessions start every hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of personal needs. During the live event, you also have two sessions each hour to choose from. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. During each session, the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link you use to access the attendance forms and you will enter the code onto the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you will have to do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit if you are watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting your attendance, you should be receiving a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, 
please resubmit the attendance form and double check to make sure your email address is typed correctly. We, along with our whole EdTech team, want to thank you again for being here today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon. If you don't have a monitor and you would like to split your screen, the steps are simple. Simply click the Windows button and the left and right arrow on your keyboard. You can also go up and down if you so choose. I'm going to do that now. I can repeat the process on the other window and have split my screen. Sometimes you get the option to be able to choose. I've split my screen to the right and now I need to tell them what I would like to put on the left. Those are the steps of splitting your screen on a Windows device. Welcome to EdTech Live. We're happy that you're here today. I'm Tamara and this is Ryan. We would like to take a moment and welcome you to today's event and give you a little information about what to expect. New sessions start every hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of personal needs. During the live event, you also have two sessions each hour to choose from. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. During each session, the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link you use to access the attendance forms and you will enter the code onto the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you will have to do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit if you are watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting your attendance, you should be receiving a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, please resubmit the attendance form and double check to make sure your email address is typed correctly. We, along with our whole EdTech team, want to thank you again for being here today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon. If you don't have a monitor and you would like to split your screen, the steps are simple. Simply click the Windows button and the left and right arrow on your keyboard. You can also go up and down if you so choose. I'm going to do that now. I can repeat the process on the other window and have split my screen. Sometimes you get the option to be able to choose. I've split my screen to the right, and now I need to tell them what I would like to put on the left. Those are the steps of splitting your screen on a Windows device. Welcome to EdTech Live. We're happy that you're here today. I'm Tamara and this is Ryan. We would like to take a moment and welcome you to today's event and give you a little information about what to expect. New sessions start every hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of personal needs. During the live event, you also have two sessions each hour to choose from. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. During each session, 
the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link you use to access the attendance forms and you will enter the code onto the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you will have to do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit if you are watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting your attendance, you should be receiving a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, please resubmit the attendance form and double check to make sure your email address is typed correctly. We, along with our whole EdTech team, want to thank you again for being here today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon. If you don't have a monitor and you would like to split your screen, the steps are simple. Simply click the Windows button and the left and right arrow on your keyboard. You can also go up and down if you so choose. I'm going to do that now. I can repeat the process on the other window and have split my screen. Sometimes you get the option to be able to choose. I've split my screen to the right and now I need to tell them what I would like to put on the left. Those are the steps of splitting your screen on a Windows device. Hello, we are back. Welcome back. Uh, thank you for joining us. We are excited to continue this EdTech Live event with another wonderful session. Who do we have coming up? You know what? People are going to be so excited when they see who this is. It's Laura Dyer. Yeah. Um, she's currently a sixth grade science multi-classroom leader at Klein Intermediate. We couldn't keep her on over here, but she is always willing to help us out. And I keep her on speed dial. She yes. has worn many hats in her 18 years of education world from teaching to specialist to the Promethean trainer, as you guys probably remember her at for Fair and now back into the classroom. In that time, she has learned a ton of tech tools and she really likes showing how to use them with her peers and her students. Yeah, Laura, we are so excited to learn a lot of these tools that you're going to show us. Yeah, I'm excited to show them. It's good to see you ladies this morning. Yes. You too. All right, we're ready to get started. Morning, everyone. Um, I've been kind of watching some of the other sessions on YouTube, and it looks like you're learning some great stuff this morning. Hopefully, you refilled your coffee um, and you are ready to learn how to put some of this creating in your students' hands. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And get myself set up. Give me just a second. All right. Um, so I am going to talk to you today about how to let this show you what what they know. Um, however, because I'm just here alone in my house, I'm not there with you. Um, I really want to make this as personal as I can. So I'm giving you the bit.ly right up front. Um, if you want to go get my slides. If you are an advanced learner and you want to move along and kind of go a little faster than I'm going, please feel free to. Um, I would recommend if you are an advanced tech learner to go ahead and jump to slide seven. That is going to be where the tech tools I'm sharing are at. Because I want to slow down a little bit and really want to talk this morning to that teacher who is a little nervous, who's a little hesitant, um, or maybe is just getting started with incorporating some tools in their classroom, I wanna talk about my experience of going back into the classroom. So as the lady said, um, I have a lot of gears and I've worn a lot of different hats. Um, I've been a math teacher, I've been a tech trainer, I've been a specialist, and now I love the role I'm doing. I am back in the classroom teaching sixth grade science. And then I'm also um, getting to be a coach. So kind of like a dual teacher slash specialist role. It's really fun. Um, and if you want to connect with me, uh, I put my email address up there. I put my Twitter handle up there. Feel free to take a screenshot of those. Feel free to email me, tweet any of this. Out. I love connecting with other educators. So here we go. 
Okay, so my objective in our hour together is to help you kind of reframe your thinking a little bit. I know that you spend a lot of time making lessons. Um, so I want to show you how to put some of that creating in the students' hands, which will free you up to do some small groups, um, to check for understanding with specific students, maybe even sit down at your desk and drink a sip of that coffee that isn't warm anymore. Um, so that is my goal is to kind of take some of the work off of you and let's put it in the students' hands. Uh, this all comes under the umbrella of whoever is doing the work is the one who's doing the learning. So I am teaching science this year and I've never taught science before. So I have to learn the material before I teach it to the kids, which has really shaped me as a teacher. It's really changed how I teach because I have to think about how did I have to learn it? And then now how can I replicate that experience for my students? Um, they can't, I can't just tell them what I learned. They need to dig in and really create and play with the material the same way I had to for me to learn it. All right, so again, uh, if anyone is like, Laura, I am already doing this. I do not need you to explain to me how to get it started. Please feel free to jump to slide seven uh, and start looking through some of the tools. But if you are this and you wanna just kinda hear my experience and learn from my experience, then you can stay with me. Okay. Um, on our first step, I had to rethinking. I had to create uh, a variety of ways for my students to learn by me being uh, the project manager of my classroom. Ladies, I did just get a message that my internet is unstable. So I don't know if there's a way for you to communicate with me. Just make sure everyone can still hear me and see me. <laughs> Um, so instead of me kind of doing what I'm doing right now, this is very uncomfortable for me because I do not do this in my classroom at all. I do not talk for 45 minutes at my students. Um, I rarely stand up in front of my classroom and talk. If I'm up in front of my classroom, I'm setting expectations, I'm telling them how to do it, and then I'm releasing the class and they are going to do what they are expected to do. And as the project manager, what I mean by that is I am then working the room. I am going around the room, checking on each student, I'm pulling small groups, I'm making sure that they're making progress and meeting those deadlines, those expectations. Now, this does not happen on day one. This did not happen overnight. Um, so I wanna talk you through a little bit about how I released control of me having the whole class and the whole group doing the same thing and how I got myself to a place where I can just manage the classroom. Okay, um, let me just stay right here for just a second and talk about, so the last time I was in the classroom, it was sixth grade math and it was the year where COVID happened, where we didn't get to finish the year. But what I started with was I, was instead of the lesson I was gonna teach, I started making videos. So most of you have a document camera in your classroom and that is what I used. I would stay five, maybe 10 minutes after school and I would do the example, do the lesson, um, do the vocabulary, whatever it was that I wanted them, like the meat of the next day's lesson. I it did not put the camera on my face. This is very uncomfortable for me <laughs> to have the camera on my face. I had the document camera on my hand and it was picking up my voice. And so I would just record a little five minute video. That was my first step in releasing myself of needing to be the sage on the stage, the one up in front of the classroom. So many benefits to this. So if you're not sure how to get started, I would go with this. I didn't need any special website or tools. It was just my document camera. It gave me a chance to think through my lesson and really like trim the fat off my lesson. What is the five minute max? Cause nobody's gonna watch a video longer than five minutes. What do they really need to get out of tomorrow's lesson? I only had to say it once cause it was video recorded. Um, and it helped me really think it through. So then the next day I came in feeling very confident in what I was teaching. My students had access to that video forever. So a month from then when they couldn't remember something or later that day in the lesson, they had my video to go back to. 
Uh, so that was kind of my step one in this process was building those videos and then just popping them in Schoology. Uh, so that's kind of what I was doing pre-pandemic. And then a lot of things happened in the next few years. I became a specialist. I didn't have my own classroom, but I was watching other teachers. And so I gathered a bunch of tools that they use. So I'm going to showcase those in a minute. But if you're hesitant or you're not sure, that to me is step one in releasing that control. Make a video, pop it in Schoology, and the, or whatever um, learning management system your school is using, Google Classroom, doesn't matter. However, you can get that video to the kids. And then so many wonderful things can happen the next day. You can pull a small group of kids who you know that video is not going to work for, or you know you maybe need to reteach the so that's actually what I started with doing this year with my science students. The small group that I would pool, they were actually doing a card sort from the previous unit to like check for understanding. Um, and it's because this is kind of the model that I'm using right now with my students. So I'll talk through this a little bit. Um, and it's December and this is really just where me and my So take it at your own pace. Don't feel like you have to jump into this. So I started with a small tool that we all felt comfortable with. I'm comfortable with recording a video. Um, they're very comfortable with Google Slides, Nearpod, Edpuzzle, Kahoot, things they didn't need me to teach them how to use. Um, so what I do is I provide them with an activity to do. So maybe it's watch this video, maybe like this current unit, I made a Google Slideshow that just had each of the vocabulary words that we were supposed to learn. Um, they were some very strange words for them. We're in the unit where we're learning luster, malleability, um, ductile, brittle. These are words that they couldn't just type in the definition. They actually had to go look at some images, read the definition, really try to understand. So I didn't create anything for them other than a slideshow, one word per slide. I asked them to find the definition, find a picture, and write their own sentence. That was their independent task that they worked on. Okay, now that works for me in my science classroom. All you have to do, the only planning you need to do is think of what's something they could do independently that they wouldn't need me for. So while 90% of the class, I'm pulling a small group and I started the first time I did this, I did something that was from the previous unit so that my small group didn't 100% need me. And that was strategic. So when I pull that group, I give them their card sort, their fact was that they should be successful at. I ask them to do it. And then I walk around with my clipboard and I try to have an example of my expectation on there of what I should see as I'm walking around. And it has all my students' names. And so this is where the project manager part comes in. So I am walking the room and I am checking what word is each kid on? What slide are they on? What step are they on? I'm making a note for myself. And this is where I'm correcting, you know, minor behaviors. I'm making sure we're on the right thing, making sure we're getting started. Maybe this is where I have a card for myself of some deeper level thinking questions. So if I get to a kid who's really chugging along and I want to check for their understanding, that's the only planning I did. I didn't build this you know, long lesson of these slides like I'm doing with you, I just had to think up the questions I was going to ask. What were the two tasks? What's my independent group doing? And what is my small group doing? Now, I will warn you, the first time you do this, you need to give yourself grace, give your students grace, and understand that everything that goes wrong is an opportunity to learn and make it better. So every time I do this with a group of students, something different goes wrong. <laughs> Uh, and so that's just moments for us to correct and get better and better at this. Because what you'll you'll forget about something like how are they going to go to the bathroom if they're you know intermediate or older without interrupting you in your small group time? How are they going to get supplies um, when you go back to your small group and you're sitting down with them and you're talking with them and checking for their understanding? Can you see every kid in your classroom? Can you see everyone's screen? So you might have to rethink how you set up your classroom that day, where the supplies are. Um, I always forget to tell them what my level expectation is. So all of those little things that you forget along the way, 
just make notes and then fix it the next day. Don't feel like you did something wrong. So this is where I would start for that teacher who's like, oh my gosh, you want me to just let them create stuff? It's gonna be a disaster. No, I want you to just have them do one thing while you do something different, creates that separation and it helps you to see what they can do on their own. You know your kids, you know the grade level, you know what they can handle. Okay, I'm gonna stop for a minute actually before we go to the next step. I think they need to do attendance uh, or something like that and maybe see if there's any questions. Same yeah, let's go ahead and do attendance right now. So um, again, guys, uh, we're really looking forward to um, getting y'all the credit that you need for joining us here at EdTech Live. So I'm going to go ahead and show you guys the attendance code for this session. So get out your pencil and paper or your Google Doc, whatever you're using to write down this attendance code on. And this session's code is TOOLS, T-O-O-L-S. Write it down. Ryan, um, what if we're watching it over here, but they want to see what's going on in that other room? What happens? The other channel? Yeah, it's not, I know it's not as fun as over here, but. Because no, we're the crazy ones. Um, you can totally go jump over and watch channel B um, if you would like to uh, later today or tomorrow and you can get the attendance codes for that channel as well and then when you submit all of your codes how many hours does that equal of pd credit eight eight if you watch all eight sessions but what time? Eight what hours. time is there a time limit though there that? is there is you have to submit that all of these codes by sunday so tomorrow by midnight the weather's yucky. You don't have any other thing to do anyway, but learn from all these cool sessions that we're hosting today. Exactly. So make use of, you know, being stuck inside on a cloudy, gloomy day. Drink all the coffee that you want and need because we are. <laughs> and learn. And learn. Because all of these sessions are really great. All right, and, let's let Laura get okay. back. Okay, sorry. We went off on a little tangent there. So Laura, <laughs> we're gonna throw it back over to you so we can keep learning some more of these great tools and apps. Isn't she amazing? <laughs> yes. Thank you, I'm having fun. Uh, it's so weird to like be in my house talking to myself, but having fun, love that you ladies are here with me. Okay, let's jump back in to my screen. Okay, I hope that you guys have been able to see this the whole time. Um, cause now all of a sudden I have a green box around. I would think about this point in my life, I'd know how to use zoom, <laughs> but just always learning, always learning. Okay. So we've, we've talked about how to get it rolling, how to get it started. And then the next thing that I do with my students, and I'm going to have to give credit where credit is due. I learned about checklists from Marsha Kish. Um, I had the honor of while I was training y'all on your Promethean panels, I was kind of a fly on the wall and I was paying attention to what she was teaching y'all about blended, personalized, all that kind of stuff, uh, learning in your classroom. And I stole this idea and I love it. Um, I'm sure I do not do it to her level of amazingness, but this is how it works for me and my students. So when we start a new unit, my students come in and they get a checklist and they know that that checklist is due by a certain date. So um, I had to snip it off because the student's name was at the top, but at the top it has the due date on it. So it's whenever that unit is done. So if it's Friday, if it's the following Monday, they know when my expectation is that these assignments are done. Um, and so sometimes I link them right on there, as you can see. Um, sometimes I just put them in Schoology. I change these up as I go. Um, the current one I'm using with my class does not look like this. It looks a little different. This is where your teacher creativity can come in. Um, I try to keep them as simple as possible. And I would advise start with a paper checklist. But this is where you can start adding the creation part. So let's say that first thing is a video that they're supposed to copy the notes. So we're not doing a whole group. They're doing it at their own pace at their seat, copying those notes over. And then they're supposed to watch a video. Um, I had two videos that day. 
that they needed to get done. But what I loved about this checklist is I asked them to tell me one thing they learned. And so that really gave me some good feedback. So don't correct the grammar on that one. That was a sixth grade student um, just on their first try using this style of checklist. And it worked really well for us. But this is where, this was last unit's checklist. So my current unit checklist, um, what I had my students doing was they did the vocabulary. So I just gave them the words on a Google slideshow. They had to go look up luster, malleability, conduct, conduct sorry, tongue twister, <laughs> ductile, conductor, all of those words. They had to give me a picture. They had to write me a sentence and give me a definition. And something kind of magical happened out of this. One of the words was brittle. And if I had told them what brittle meant and I had given them a picture, this never would have happened. But when my kids went to search brittle, you can do it right now and you'll see what Google images you get, you, um, a snack food pops up, a sweet treat called brittle. And so I was reading through their definitions and their sentences and they were all talking about this candy, this food, this thing they had never tried. And so we actually got to bring some in and have them try it and then talk about why is that thing named brittle? So what does brittle actually mean? And why is this piece of food named brittle? I, I don't know if it's a cookie, if it's a candy, I, I can't really define it. You guys can put it in the chat. <laughs> okay, so this is my list, a very small collection. So please know that there is way more out there um, of tools I like to give the kids to create. So I kind of organized them a little bit for you. So all you have to think about when you're creating your checklist is kind of like what can get them started, what independently, and then that last item. So on my current checklist, it doesn't say card sort with teacher. It has one of these for them to create a brochure. That was our first creation that we did in class. So my students um, for this unit are using Adobe Creative Cloud Express uh, to create me a brochure. So they know the vocabulary, they've practiced with it. Um, they've done a couple of Nearpods, they've done a word wall, you guys don't know about wordwall.com. It's a really great tool. They've done some card sorts. They've done a lab. They're ready to create a brochure. So that is where my students are at. Instead of me creating it, instead of me making um, the vocabulary to hang up on the wall for our in-class word wall, they're creating uh, a tool that they can go back and look at. So let's just go through a couple of these. If you want your students to draw something, um, if they don't know about Chrome Canvas yet, you are lucky because <laughs> my students, the second they have a moment of free time, they are in Chrome Canvas. It is an app right there on their Chromebook. They don't have to go search it. It's like a whiteboard right there on their Chromebook. So if you're needing a whiteboard tool, this is a great, very simple, uh, let's see if it'll let me open it. Very simple tool. Oh, so I was drawing um, an example of a cell please do not judge my drawing. <laughs> so I already have one in there, but to create a new drawing, very simple tools. Um, so definitely good for younger students, um, but my sixth graders, they love it. They're on here drawing really cool pictures. I'm actually gonna show you in a second where I have some student samples. Okay, so that's Chrome Canvas. Um, Sumo, and Brush Ninja are also great tools, but I don't want to run out of time. So I did ask SciFair which ones they'd like me to highlight. And those are the ones with the stars. So I'm going to talk about ones my students have used and then the ones SciFair has asked me to highlight. So I'm going to say Kelki. If I'm saying it wrong, feel free to correct me. Um, but the benefit of Kelki, while it looks similar, it is a whiteboard uh, over here on the side. They can get different tools. They can change the color. So let me just draw a little bit here for you. Um, let's get a different color. Okay. Um, they can change the thickness, the opacity. Um, they can do a lot of things just there with the pen. I got pretty excited about this one. I thought this was kind of cool that you could do that. So. 
just having some fun. <laughs> so this one's called Kelki, but what the benefit to this one is, is that you can layer. So there can be different layers to your drawing. And I made an example. Let's see if I still have it open. So here I have a cell where it's not the best image, but if I had asked the kids, go find me a picture, I simply copy and pasted this. So I Google, found it, copy image, came back, hit control V, pasted it, okay? Then I could create a second layer and I brought the same picture in again, but this time, so one time I whited out the words and then one time I didn't. So having a student create a little activity like this and then put it up on your classroom display. Um, so all you need to do is grab that HDMI cord, plug it into their Chromebook. Students can come up, they could write, oops, I still have the white, oh, that's too thick. Okay, they could be writing the answers and then they could go check their work. So it was just something simple to show you that there's layers to it. Um, but really what I wanna talk about with all of these tools is you do not need to know how to use these tools. I will be very transparent with you. I do not know how to use all these tools. I, this is not, drawing is not my preferred way to show my learning. And so this is not what I would pick if I was given a choice board, but I have students who are amazing artists and they will draw all day long. And if I give them a tool like Kelki and I put it in their hands, they will run with it they will create amazing things. What I have to remind myself daily is that these are kids who survived a pandemic. These are kids who were at home by themselves for at least a year, some up to three years, figuring things out, learning things. Now, no, they weren't looking up the teaks and making sure that they were learning the correct things, but technology is something they are not afraid of. So if I put a tool in their hand, they will research it, they will figure it out. And some kids won't, some kids will prefer Adobe, some kids will prefer Kami. But if I don't give them these tools, we'll never find out which one is best for them. So don't feel pressure like, oh, I have to go research all of these and I have to be the expert. I have no problem saying to my students, I don't know, why don't you Google it? Why don't you find a video on it? Why don't you ask your neighbor? they will do it. They will figure it out if it's something, a tool that's good for them and that helps them showcase their thinking. So I'll say Chrome Canvas, very simple if that's what you want your kids just to draw. So that was what I did here. I was like for the kid, so this is for the advanced kid. <laughs> and then this is, you know, just a cell, very simple drawing. They could label the different parts. All right, so the next row of tools there, are different ways to make posters, infographics, um, pictures, slideshows, videos. They all kind of do it all, um, but it's. I just kind of had to give them all a category. Like they probably could have fit in all these categories, but I was just trying to help you narrow down what works best where. Um, so I think I'm gonna leave this up and just ask the girls, are there any questions coming in, like a specific tool people would like me to talk about, one they've used, anything like that? Um, I think uh, Adobe Creative Cloud, Adobe Express, because I know like they went through they went through a few name changes. Yeah. Uh, right. So we started out with like Adobe Spark, and yeah. that was what two years ago, three years ago. Yeah. And then they went to the Adobe Creative Cloud Express, and now it's just Adobe Express. <laughs> um, we love how much there is that you can you can do in Adobe. Um, so maybe look at um, Adobe Express or um, the storytelling tools is what I'm I'm seeing now in the YouTube chat. So storytelling or uh, Adobe Creative Cloud. All right, great. Thank. Good to get some feedback as I'm in my house talking to myself. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's jump into Adobe. And yes, whatever your school is currently calling it. Um, now for my students, we have a dashboard that has all their tools on it. And this is already a tool for the kids. Um, so your kids might just need to sign in with Google. Uh, but on my slide here, 
each of these is a link straight to that resource, but you can see mine is struggling to load. Uh, it might be because I'm on my school computer. So let me just see real quick if I go through my dashboard, if I will have more success. But again, these do not feel like you need to learn all these tools because that is never going to happen. <laughs> um, you just put the tool in their hand and the first time that they play with it, you might not get a great product and that's okay. You took the first step. Now you can set expectations for the next one. And actually on this last, this brochure assignment that I gave the kids, I made a paper brochure and I, you know, put my artwork into it and what I, my expectation was. And then I told the kids, you can make a paper one or you can do it digitally. And so they had a vision of what my expectation was. And then that helped them to create their digital expectation. So, right, this is the main page when you come in, um, create a new project. So they can hit this plus sign right here and see the infinite amount of options that they have here. So the first time I give them this tool, I wouldn't just say, go for it, have fun. Say, I want you to go to Adobe Express and I want you to make a flyer. I want you to make uh, an infographic. Tell them specifically, you know, or maybe narrow it down to two or three. Depending on your kids, depending on their age, um, limit, you know, maybe on the first try what you want from them. The only reason I say that is they will actually spend too long playing and getting an idea and switching it and, oh, I liked this better. Can I start over? If you just narrow it down for them, it helps a lot. But I am going to be very transparent and I don't really use Adobe Express for myself. <laughs> my students use it. I put it in their hands and they run with it. So what I wanna show you on my slides here is some of the student examples that we've collected. So um, each tool that I have for you is a little description, the cost, and then some ideas for how to use it or like what is its benefit over the other tools. And then I have a page with student samples. And then if you see a picture that has the pink bar around it, that means it's taking you to a video, an article, something to deepen your learning. Chasing that and want to save time on proofreading. I don't want you to have to research those. So I put them in there for you. So if you're like, okay, I want to see another teacher use it or see how to use it, you can watch those videos. So here for Adobe Express, posters, videos, infographics, um, it is free, project-based learning, presentations, and reviews of concepts. And then here are some student samples of what they did in one of my teacher's classrooms. This was not my class. Um, this was our Principles of Human Services teacher, what we used to call home ec. <laughs> this was in her class. So this was students using that tool to show their thinking. And I can tell you right now, she would probably not consider herself an expert at Adobe Express. She puts the tools in the students' hands and lets them run with it. Um, and then if you want some more, so this, because it has the pink around it, I know it's taking me to an article or a video. And this is showing 16 different ways to use Adobe Express. So speech and language play, sight word proficiency, narrative prompts, rhyming games, playing with shapes and colors, second language acquisition, story starters, creative storytelling, collaborative storytelling. Okay, it's just going on and on. <laughs> uh, tons of resources here. Oh, science fair projects. All right. So that is kind of how my slides go. Um, each one tells you about a different tool and then provides you with some student samples. So feel free to look through those. Um, let's go back to actual Adobe Express and look around a little bit here. So I do like that it already comes with some of these features, like removing the background. Um, there's websites that can help you do that, but I like that it's all just right here. So my students aren't trying to go to seven different places. Um, just a very simple tool would be, hey, we learned about this. I want you to go make a GIF. Like they know what they are. They know how to make them or they're about to learn how to make one. Um, 
making a little quick video right here. And it, it's not super intensive, like it's kind of user friendly once you start clicking around. And then what I would suggest is walk around and watch them, let them show each other, let them teach you what they're learning from that. All right, so that was under the poster infographic and I put it in the video one as well. Um, I did put Flipgrid on here. Well, I don't have any student samples of Flipgrid. It is a great tool for them, especially for elementary or if you don't have a device for every kid, it can kind of be a station in your classroom and it's a little more, it's like you tell them what to respond to or what you want them to talk about in their video. Um, they can watch each other's, they cannot watch each other's. You get to kind of control that a little bit and it's all kept right there within Flipgrid. So I put that under the video one, um, but it's not really kids designing their own videos. It's them responding to you and to a prompt you give them. Um, the storytelling, okay, so let's go to book creator. Where is that slide at? You guys said you wanted to talk about that. So I really like this, especially for elementary kids, but we had our middle school kids write books for the elementary kids. And so those came out pretty cute. Um, if you go to Book Creator and put this code in, you'll see, so let me see if I go ahead and copy that and then go to Book Creator. You'll be able to see the ones that our kiddos made for the elementary kids. And I made one of these, um, I think when we were trying to do like a virtual open house, I just took screenshots of a slideshow I had done and put them in a book. Um, but what's cool about it with students is that you can get them printed out, I believe. I don't know if that's still a feature, but I know that was a feature. Why is it not wanting me to go to Book Creator? Let's try it this way and then I'll move on. I do keep getting a message that my internet is struggling, so we'll blame it on that. Okay, so right here, book creator, you can look at videos, you can look at sources. Um, I was expecting there to be a login button. We'll just go with Google. Continue as a teacher. Okay, so when you, where did we put that code in last time? I'm sorry, guys. Oh, I think I'm, I was already in it in that library. Yes, this is our secondary PHS library. Um, and these are the books that our students made for elementary students. And so let's just pick one to showcase. Let's do Tommy Goes for a Walk. <laughs> so they're putting text, they're putting pictures, um, putting their own personality, their own spin. All right. <laughs> um, and then I'm not sure if this tool has it, but you could easily um, do Screencastify on top of this and have them actually read the book and then share that with parents, put that in their portfolio. Um, let's go back to library. I'm trying to remember where I put that code in at to become a part of that library. But I guess you could just go into Discover. Um, they've got holiday collections, digital citizenship activities, books to remix, and they already have a bunch of books here. So that is bookcreator.com. Sorry, I can't see. Oh, there's something new. Let's see what they have there. Oh, so you can become a certified author. That's cool. So let's go back and look at, so we've done one of the storytelling ones. We've done a place where they can make posters. So we've done a place where they can draw. And then uh, I wanna talk about where they can do some 3D drawings. 
um, because I did hear that Tyker is getting some 3D printers. And so if you wanna be one of the teachers who gets to utilize that, this might be the lane you wanna start working in. So Tinkercad, and again, if I'm saying that wrong, I'm sorry, um, is a way for students to draw 3D images and then they can print them out. Um, so let's log in, I'm an educator. Feel free to be doing this along with me, guys. Uh, okay, so my students have not quite gotten here yet, <laughs> um, but when your kids do get here, you just create a new class. So enter your class name, practice. Um, so that would be sixth grade. Um, All right. So then I can add my students in here. I can add activities for them to do. And let's see, create your first activity. Um, name your activity. Let's say I want them to build a cell. It looks like since I don't have any students in here, um, you can't really see the outcome. So I'm gonna go back to my slide. So you can see what some students did make in another class. So there is the cell that some students made in another class. Um, that was not my students. We aren't ready for that yet. <laughs> uh, some random 3D drawings that the, some of our students did. And then you can see here, there's two, there's some videos and some resources. So when you click here, it's gonna take you to learn more about Tinkercad. Um, but again, I would highly suggest if you are waiting until you fully understand this tool, you're gonna be waiting a while. <laughs> you wanna just put it in your student's hands. Here you go, now you can, so you can watch a student just go into town, building, creating, um, you'll be amazed at what your students can come up with if you just put the tool in their hand. And then you can borrow the 3D printer and have them print them out. And then this one, I believe, had lesson plans, which I thought was really cool, uh, right there on their site. So it's how I was trying to create a lesson. I probably, if I was doing this with my students, would just go in here and pick one of these pre-made ones uh, at least for our first time to get them utilizing the tool. So some really cool options. I love when a site already has stuff made for us. Um, you can look through their gallery and see what other students have been making. Really cool stuff. So that's kind of how um, my slides work. You can either go straight to the site and play around. Um, you can, look at some student samples uh, of the work that I have in here, learn a little bit more about the tool. Um, WeVideo and Screencastify are great tools if you want your students editing videos, building videos. Uh, Screencastify is pretty simple. Um, it's right there on Google. You just add it right here like as an extension. Um, and then I've reached my limit, but um, depending on your district, you might be able to utilize that more. Um, that's a great tool too. If you're trying to make those quick videos for your students, you could make one and then ask them to go make one of their work. And basically it's just, you can record your screen is the simplest way I like to use Screencastify. Uh, but then here are some other ideas. So I wanted to give you ideas of what other teachers are using it for. Uh, what's how teachers are using we video to get their student voice. Uh, the best idea I think I heard to get started with we video was have everyone in your class make a one minute video about themselves. So it only has to be one minute and it just gets them playing with the website playing with the tool. Uh, Brush Ninja is a very good tool for the younger kids. It's a pretty simple drawing tool. 
um, but they can get more advanced. These are some samples from a student we had. Anytime he got his work done, this was what he wanted to do with his time. So while it's not super educational, it got him engaged, got him getting his work done. Um, but I did link some educational animations there for you uh, if you want to go see how students are utilizing Brush Ninja in the classroom. All right. Uh, Pixton is making comic strips. Um, so there's one from a social studies class. Um, and I know that they use comic strips a lot in their social studies lessons. So Pixton is a tool where the kids can actually go make their own comic strip. Floor planner. Um, our PHS teacher was using it to let them design their dream homes. But for our students who have trouble with, you know, spatial recognition and thinking about things in a 3D way, uh, floor planner is a great tool, especially like for surface area, volume, those types of lessons. They can go in there and really see something from every angle. And then the last thing I would highly encourage you to do is if you're having kids build stuff, having kids create stuff, let them share it with each other. So maybe that's a gallery walk. Everyone opens their Chromebook and they walk around the room and see what each other is making. Maybe you let them display up on the screen in class. Uh, make sure you're letting them showcase their learning and their thinking and asking each other questions about it. That's really where you're going to see them come to life. Um, so I just want everyone to remember this generation grew up with technology in their hands. They are not afraid of it. So if you're intimidated, if you're afraid, if you're nervous, start with a tool you feel comfortable with and then watch how they grow and how they learn and how they figure it out. Um, it's, you know, their native language. Um, you do not need to fully understand a tool before you put it in the kids' hands. Let them figure it out. Let them play with it. Let their first time maybe not be their best, but set an expectation for the next time that they use that same tool. Um, remember that our current students spend at least a year by themselves at home. So I'm trying my best in my classroom to capitalize on that. They, they can be independent. They know how to be independent. I hear a lot of teachers say, you know, they're constantly interrupting me. They don't know how to sit still through a lesson. And I'm like, yeah because they didn't have to. <laughs> they could get up and talk and move whenever they wanted to. So let's capitalize on that and let's put the work in their hands. Let's let them create some of this and let's focus on pulling that small group, really being intentional with those kids uh, and catching up anyone who did fall behind in, in these COVID years. Um, and then please, please, please remember to have grace with yourself, learn and adjust as you go. You will not get it perfect on the first try and you don't need to wait until you have it all figured out and all together. Um, trust me, I did not. And I've been doing this for a long time, but I'm teaching a new content this year. I'm at a new school, um, sixth graders who, you know, some of their formative elementary years was during COVID. And so we're having to learn as we go. That didn't work, that did work. Um, you need to be in my small group first. <laughs> uh, and that's what I'm doing when I, I pull that first small group, I know who needs me first. And then when I'm doing my walk around the room to see how they're doing, I'm making notes on my clipboard. Of, okay, you're gonna be in my next group. You're not quite hitting the mark. And that's where I'm correcting behaviors, resetting expectations, checking for understanding and then sending them back out. So I hope that you can utilize some of this. Um, if you do any of this with your students and you get some awesome samples, please tag me in tweeting it out or whatever it is you do with it. Um, feel free to connect with me. The last slide here I did share, there were just so many resources and I had to narrow it down. So these links just take you to more and more. Um, there's some social media resources, there's project-based resources and there's design resources, plus even more. Um, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I see that I'm done a little early. So I'm gonna ask the ladies if there's any questions, anything I can go into more detail on. So I love that um, you showed Tinkercad because uh, we have been messing with that in our office as well, learning how to design and build 
And we actually used our 3D printer um, from our office to print some prizes for our attendees here at EdTech Live. We're gonna do like a drawing. Um, and so we have some prizes to give out that are 3D printed. And part of it was actually built in Tinkercad. And it took a little bit, like it was going back to what you just said about give yourself grace um, to learn these tools because you're not going to know it the first time. Like, no, we, we printed quite a few times. And then finally it was like, yes, we figured it out. It works. <laughs> love it. Yeah. That's and then awesome. we also love Adobe. Yeah. It is. There's so much to it. Um, and I love that they have added the make a template feature. So as a teacher, I can go in, I can choose what I want my kids to make, and then I can kind of give them an, an idea or a template to use. And then I can send that template to them. So it's not like you said, I'm not sending them free to get lost in the weeds of all the all that is in Adobe Express, because there's a lot. I get lost there quite frequently. Yes. Well, and right on, Laura, you are so awesome about, you know, kids teaching each other, kids sharing their work, you know, kids, like you said, they were by themselves teaching themselves all that time. And so now, you know, teachers, yes, give yourselves grace, but please listen to all the mental advice Laura gave you too about let the kids teach you about the tools, you know, let them give you ideas about what they want to learn. Let's, let's put the learning in their hands. And you showed some great tools for that to happen. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, so good to see you. Yeah, I see so many teachers just, I, I've only followed teachers on TikTok. It revitalizes me at the end of the day to see we're all in the struggle together. <laughs> um, but I just see so many of them frustrated that the kids can't sit through their lesson. Um, and I'm like, you know what, maybe this is a positive that came out of the pandemic that we need to shift and this has to shift. So I'm like, let's just ride that wave and let's let them create. And I don't force every kid in my room to make a digital brochure. I have some kids who prefer a piece of paper. That's great. But I have some kids who prefer to make it digitally. So this is a perfect way to personalize that learning. And I feel like I'm I've never taught in a classroom before where every kid has access to all of this. You know, it's so readily available. Um, yeah, I mean, and they're very lucky to have you in the classroom with them. But they if are. you and have a device, a great way to, to have a station, have a small group, have a paper station, have a digital station, and then a teacher station. Yeah, and when you say that it's hard for our kids to sit during a lesson, I mean, both of us are sitting here turning in chairs. Yeah. So even as adults, we find it very difficult to sit still. Oh, why not? No, <laughs> we yeah. find it hard to sit still. We just can't do it. So having that grace, understanding that, that me as an adult, as a learner, I find it difficult to sit still. Like students are going to be the same, the same way. And yeah, so finding I, them I that creative outlet computer. helps. So I could stand. <laughs> yes, <Okay>. yes. <laughs> we I, we said this last year, like we need to get rid of the spinning chairs because it's all we do is we just spin. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can't help it. Love it. Help it at all. Um, well, thank you, Laura, so much for joining us today. We greatly appreciate uh, you sharing your knowledge with us and with our teachers on these amazing tools. And we did post your bit.ly to your presentation in the YouTube chat. Uh, Connie, can you go ahead and throw that in there again? Okay, one more time. Yes. This is an awesome presentation, guys. It I mean, is. There is a ton of information in there. Yeah, there's a ton of tools, um, lots of lots of information that can help you learn about them and use them in, in your classroom with your kids on Monday. Yeah. Make sure yeah. if you're on Twitter to and even if you're not, you should be, but get on Twitter and follow Laura because she always has some great ideas on there as well. Yep, I was learning from other teachers. Love that I still have a bunch of Cypher teachers on there. <laughs> Y'all are awesome. Thanks for inviting me. This was fun. We love you, Laura. You are welcome here at any time. Anytime. All right. We, is it okay to end it early? Yeah, y'all are, we're good. Have a wonderful Saturday. We will see you later. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye.
All right, guys, we are going to take a short break. Um, it is commercial time. This is the time that you get to um, get more coffee or if we've changed to adult beverage. tea, tea or water, we've changed to water. Um, those are all good too. Hydrate the body, get up, take some steps if you need to. Um, just take care of yourself for the next eight-ish minutes and then join us back here at 12. We're going to be looking at Cami and how you can take it much further than just an annotation tool. So we will be back here um, shortly and we hope to see you then. Welcome to EdTech Live. We're happy that you're here today. I'm Tamara and this is Ryan. We would like to take a moment and welcome you to today's event and give you a little information about what to expect. New sessions start every hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of personal needs. During the live event, you also have two sessions each hour to choose from. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. During each session, the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link you use to access the attendance forms and you will enter the code onto the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you will have to do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit if you are watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting your attendance, you should be receiving a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, please resubmit the attendance form and double check to make sure your email address is typed correctly. We, along with our whole EdTech team, want to thank you again for being here today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon. If you don't have a monitor and you would like to split your screen, the steps are simple. Simply click the Windows button and the left and right arrow on your keyboard. You can also go up and down if you so choose. I'm going to do that now. I can repeat the process on the other window and have split my screen. Sometimes you get the option to be able to choose. I've split my screen to the right, and now I need to tell them what I would like to put on the left. Those are the steps of splitting your screen on a Windows device. Welcome to EdTech Live. We're happy that you're here today. I'm Tamara and this is Ryan. We would like to take a moment and welcome you to today's event and give you a little information about what to expect. New sessions start every hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of personal needs. During the live event, you also have two sessions each hour to choose from. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. During each session, the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link you use to access the attendance forms and you will enter the code onto the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you will have to do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit if you are watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting your attendance, you should be receiving a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, 
please resubmit the attendance form and double check to make sure your email address is typed correctly. We, along with our whole EdTech team, want to thank you again for being here today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon. If you don't have a monitor and you would like to split your screen, the steps are simple. Simply click the Windows button and the left and right arrow on your keyboard. You can also go up and down if you so choose. I'm going to do that now. I can repeat the process on the other window and have split my screen. Sometimes you get the option to be able to choose. I've split my screen to the right and now I need to tell them what I would like to put on the left. Those are the steps of splitting your screen on a Windows device. Welcome to EdTech Live. We're happy that you're here today. I'm Tamara and this is Ryan. We would like to take a moment and welcome you to today's event and give you a little information about what to expect. New sessions start every hour and you can stay for the whole event or just watch the sessions you're interested in seeing. There is a 10 to 15 minute break between each session where you can enter your attendance credit or take care of personal needs. During the live event, you also have two sessions each hour to choose from. After the live event, you can watch any of the other sessions on your own time. During each session, the host will give you a link and a secret code to jot down. This will be the link you use to access the attendance forms and you will enter the code onto the form. You can keep this form open throughout the event in a separate tab because you will have to do this for each session. You can still earn attendance credit if you are watching after the live event. However, you must submit by midnight tomorrow. Within an hour of submitting your attendance, you should be receiving a response receipt. If you do not receive this email, please resubmit the attendance form and double check to make sure your email address is typed correctly. We, along with our whole EdTech team, want to thank you again for being here today and enjoy your session. It will be starting soon. All right, guys, we are back. Welcome back to our final session of this EdTech Live. Next up, we have Avra Robinson, who is a teacher success champion at CAMI. She has been in education for over 25 years. She started out as an elementary classroom teacher and worked for many years as a technology coordinator and coach. In this session, Avra will demonstrate the magic of Kami beyond just annotation. Besides highlighters, drawing tools, and text boxes, Kami has many integrated multimedia tools that can help teachers design differentiated, engaging digital learning environments with scaffolds and supports that help students succeed because that's what we're all here for, right? We're also going to be looking at accessibility tools such as the dictionary and read aloud features that support our our learners. Hi, Avra, how are you today? I'm great, how are you? We're doing great. We are so excited to learn more about Kami and how it is, it's such a great tool to use beyond the annotation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for all of the work you guys have done to put this awesome event together. So, hey there, everyone. Like Ryan said, my name is Avra, and I am a teacher success champion at CAMI. Super excited to be here with you today to chat about this awesome tool. So CAMI is kind of a one-stop shop. I have been working it with teachers and students with technology for years using a lot of different tools, and there's lots of them out there that are awesome. But what I've found is that 
when there's a lot of tools, sometimes it can be overwhelming, not only for our kids, but for us. And so what I love about Cami is that it really is kind of that one-stop shop. It's that it's got a lot of different tools, multimedia tools, audio and video built right in with, you know, text and, and all of that. So we're going to have a great time today as we kind of play with it. So I'm going to start out by um inviting you to join me in a couple of different documents. So to begin with, and Ryan, let me know for sure that, you know, this is okay. I know I shared this with you. Okay, great. So um, we're going to start out, you guys, by having you go into an agenda document, okay? It's going to be a CAMI document. So if you haven't been in CAMI in a while, it may ask you to authenticate or sign in with Google. And what I'm going to do is share my screen while you all are jumping into that document. And that way then I can check to make sure that you guys are getting in and we can get started. So while you are clicking on that link and jumping into this document, let me just tell you a little bit about it. It is just kind of a, a resource document for you after our time together today. There's a lot of different links that I'll show you in a few minutes. Um, it also has a link to a collaborative activity. And so that collaborative activity is something I'm going to invite you to join me with as well. And we're going to kind of jump right in and explore Cami. So I'm going to give you guys just a minute or so to jump in and and access these documents. All right, I can see people joining. So for those of you that are joining, what I'm doing right now as kind of the facilitator of this session, um, so I'm playing like the teacher role today, I'm taking a peek down in the right corner, bottom right corner of my Cami window. And I'm looking at some circles and these circles are user icons or collaborator icons. They have people's initials in them. So I can see all of you jumping into the document right now. It's a nice way for me to kind of keep a pulse on my group, okay? And this is something that I encourage teachers to do as well. It's a wonderful feature of Cami that allows us to kind of see who has who is in the document, as well as maybe who's been in the document um, at a different time as well. So I'm just going to, again, just kind of wait and give all of you a chance to get in. For those of you that are in the document and kind of just hanging out and waiting, do take a look around. You're going to notice some different information. There is a wonderful spot that says quick links, and there there are six different links to additional resources. So Cami is amazing about creating videos and blog posts and all sorts of additional supports for you as teachers. So we have links to free tutorials. We have entire courses, like we have a level one one certification course that you can take. So if you get inspired by Cami today, you can go and learn more if you'd like. Additionally, you guys, at the bottom of the page, you're going to notice my contact information as well as Megan's contact information. So let me tell you also that I am joined today by three of my colleagues who are with you guys actually in the YouTube chat. So if you see Megan or Samantha or Sophie, all three of them are here and they are going to kind of man the chat and answer questions. So please feel free to ask questions as they come up, okay? And these ladies will do an amazing job. Um, they are all former teachers, just like I am. So they will be able to answer your questions. But you guys, there's also our contact information here for after our session today. So if you struggle, if you're wondering about something, if you even just wanna get in and brainstorm and chat, you can call me or email me anytime and it is my job to help you. So I have like the best job in the world. So for those of you that are in, I'm not sure how many folks are here, but you guys could head up to the words collaborative activity, okay? So look for those words and click on those words. They are, they are a link to another document. And this other document is actually collaborative. We're going to be able to work in it together, okay? So I'm just going to invite you to jump into yet another Cami document and get hands-on with me, okay?
All right, I see people jumping into this document as well. So you guys, this is a chance for all of you to kind of play in Kami and explore. So what I'd love for you to do is take a look over on the left-hand side of your screen, you should see the words text box. It's one of the tools that you have right now. And you can click on the text box tool and then click somewhere on the page. Yay, we've already got people doing it. So go ahead and type in something that brings you joy. I love the Christmas decorating. That's awesome. Yes, that is my plan as well. I believe that is Sophie, if, if I had to guess. Um, so yes, Sophie, that's awesome. I can't wait to see after seeing what you have done throughout the fall. I can't wait to see what you do for Christmas as well. So you guys feel free to, at this point, um, just Think about something that brings you joy and explore a little bit in this Cami environment. All right, people are jumping in and doing an awesome job of sharing. Awesome, awesome. Yay, <laughs> co-hosting with Ryan. I love it. Yeah, you guys have had a great morning together, I bet. Decorating the Christmas tree today. Love that one. Packing to move. I'm going to guess that's Megan, one of my colleagues <laughs> who is about to move in about a week. All right, going to the cookie shop once we wrap up. Awesome. Having both my kids home for the holidays. Oh, that just gave me goosebumps. That's fantastic. Um, going to a Christmas tea after this, having breakfast with my husband. Love it. Love it. Love it. Coffee. Absolutely. I actually get that one a lot. Coffee definitely brings us joy, right? A little caffeine to, to get us through the day. Resting. Hopefully you've got a winter break coming up soon, you guys, um, where you're going to be able to do that. So make sure you take time. I'm sure you hear people telling you all the time, but self-care is so important, right? So you guys, as you are playing in here and as you're exploring, do me a favor. And I see a lot of it already. You can tell you guys are teachers because there's different fonts, there's different colors, there's even the different backgrounds of the text boxes, right? So do feel free to utilize what's called the rich text editor. It's a formatting toolbar across the top of your screen. So when you are actively in your text box, you will see that up here, and you can see that that's where you can change the font, you can change the size, you could even change the line spacing. So if you had like a whole paragraph and it went to several lines, you can double space it or triple space it, that kind of thing. Um, you can change the background color, as you can see, of the text box. So this is awesome, and I love seeing this kind of exploration. You guys, whenever you start um, exploring a new tool, if you do this with your students, if you have students who are new to Cami, it can be really beneficial to put them into this kind of environment. It's low stakes, right? We don't have a lot of um, heavy content load. And so that can be really important when we're learning a new tool, all right? So thank you for taking the time to do this. While you are doing this, do me a favor and try to move someone else's text box. Try to delete someone else's text box. Try to double click inside of it and change the text that's in someone else's text box. And I'm just going to kind of hang out. I know we've got a little bit of a delay with the YouTube, so I'm not going to say it yet, but I'd be really interested to know what your, um, your experience is as you try to change someone else's words. You can add bitmojis. I just saw that pop up and you absolutely could. You can't right now. And I'm going to talk about that in a second, but um, I will show you how in just a minute that you'll be able to. So I think, guys, probably you figured out by now that one of the things that makes the Cami environment unique is that you can't, you as participants can't actually change the um other people's work, right? So each of these things that you put on the page, we at Cami call an annotation. And people can't change one another's annotations, which is really nice because if we're brainstorming or we're working together in this collaborative space, um, it can be frustrating. It can be fantastic and awesome, but it can be frustrating too for, for students and teachers if inadvertently kids move each other's stuff around or if they are um, you know changing something or accidentally deleting something or maybe accidentally on purpose because you know we have our kids who like to test the limits and that kind of thing. So what's really nice is that when you're in this Cami environment, 
you don't have to worry about someone else being able to change your stuff. Okay. Um, you guys, the next thing I want to talk about is the toolbar on the left-hand side. Okay. The toolbar on the left-hand side, my toolbar. Okay. So if you're, if you are in the Cami document, you might want to come back to, to look at the YouTube for a second. Okay. And look at my screen share. What you'll notice is that I have far more tools than you do. Okay. And I did that by design. So what I want you to know is one of my very favorite things about Cami is that you as a teacher have control of the learning environment of the digital learning environment for your students so what i've done is i've started you all out with just a couple of tools okay and what i'm going to do next is actually um have you get more tools okay so i'm going to show you how i do that so if you want come on back to the um youtube and just watch me for a second because i want to show you how i can control the features of Cami. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to the top right of my screen. And what you'll notice is you're going to see a series of icons across the top. And one of the icons is called the share document icon. It looks like a, a less than sign or a molecule. And if I click on that, what you'll notice is that I get the option to share this document. And as I share this document, I can do the same kinds of things that I would normally do in the, um, in the, in the typical Google sharing. Okay. But I can take it a step further with Cami by going in to the control features. And if I click on that, then what I get is a list of all the features, all the tools in Cami. And I've got a really quick all on or all off button across the top. I can also go in and just select certain things. So if I'm an ELA teacher and I want my kids to have the highlighter and maybe I want them to have the drawing tool, you know, maybe I want them to have the dictionary. I want them to have just those three tools because that's what we're going to work on. Maybe we are practicing for like the star test, right? And we want them just to have certain tools. Or maybe I'm a, a teacher who works with um, a special population or elementary kids who are going to get overwhelmed by having too many tools. I can start out by just giving them the text box. And that's the only thing I give them. That way they're not overwhelmed. Okay. So what I'm going to do though right now is I'm going to actually turn all the tools on for you because I want to give you the chance to play. All right. So I'm going to hit all on and I'm going to go down to the bottom of the page and I'm going to hit okay. And if we were live together in the same Zoom room, you would see immediately that this popped up. Probably what's happened is that you may have noticed it already by the time you're hearing this, okay? So you guys, now you have all of the tools in Cami, okay? And you can add things like images if you want. You can play with the drawing tool. So what I wanna do right now is take about three minutes and really just let you explore before I kind of invite you to sit back and just watch the rest of this, which will be a demonstration. But I'd love for you right now to head down to the add media tool. And if you do, you can go up and you can find a folder icon that allows you to pull something from your computer. You could take a selfie. Bonus points for anyone who wants to take a selfie, okay? You could pull in something from a Google image search if you'd like. So you guys, there are actually like four or five more pages to this document. Feel free to scroll down and let's make a mess of the page. Let's just add stuff to it and take all these tools out for a spin and see what they can do. And I'm just going to hang tight and watch you guys have some fun. Again, bonus points for anyone who wants to show me their face. Mantha, my good friend, Samantha, thank you for being here and taking a selfie. I love it. Anyone out there that wants to take a selfie, I would love to see your face right now. I wish we were all in a classroom together, although, you know, being able to connect virtually is so much fun, but there's nothing like being in person. So let's use some of these tools and see if we can get other people to share their face or a picture that they've got, something that brings you joy or anything at all. Feel free to play with any of the tools.
If you do want to add your Bitmoji, if you have it saved on your computer, this would be your chance to do that. You could go to add media and go up to the my computer or a copy and paste works as well. So if you use like the Google Chrome extension for your Bitmoji and you right click on, on the picture and then you want to paste it in, you can do that as well. All right, I see Sophie. Yay! I love these pictures, you guys. This is fantastic. Ooh, what beautiful Christmas cookies. Those are awesome. <laughs> All right, ladies. I love it. That's fantastic. Ooh, we've got someone in here who's smarter than I am. <laughs> Sophie, is that you? No, maybe not. Um, I have to look and see who that is. Yeah, that is Sophie. All right. Someone who is smarter than I am doing the math with the equation tool. That's fantastic. I am an ELA girl all the live long day, you guys. So I'm always really um, impressed by people who can do math and know what it means. All right. Love seeing the high that just popped up. This is fantastic, you guys. Thank you for taking the time to just kind of explore and play. Again, I'm just going to reiterate that if you're ever teaching this tool to students, giving them the time and the space to be able to explore and um, do it in this kind of fun, low stakes environment where, you know, they don't have to worry about making a mistake, you know, right? We're not going to put them in here at the same time as trying to teach them to annotate text, right? Like we're not going to try to have them do something that's got a heavy cognitive load because it's too much to do content at the same time as, as playing with a new tool, right? So I love the pictures that are coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is awesome. And what is Megan's? I'm going to zoom out a little bit so I can see Megan. Megan, you're cleaning today. So no picks. Oh, absolutely. I, <laughs> you are getting ready to move, lady. No worries at all. Ooh, someone just found the graphic organizers. So this is awesome, you guys. All right. I'm going to give us about one minute left to play and explore. And then I'm going to just kind of... Um, invite you to to come on back to the YouTube to sit back and relax. And we're going to just, you know, I will take questions the whole time, but I'm going to do a demonstration to share a bunch of ideas with you and a bunch of um, just workflows and things like that in Cami. All right, so here's the really cool thing about Cami, because I, I gave you all of the tools, okay, but what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to go up back up to that share button. And I'm going to turn off the tools. Okay, so this may be taking people by surprise, because I know, um, again, we've got the the little bit of the delay with being on YouTube live, but I'm going to turn off all the tools and I want you to think about this, because What's really cool is that you as a teacher, even after you've put your students into this kind of collaborative environment, um, you can now say, hey, time to come back together as a group, right? So kind of like when we say, let's you know, close our computers or um, whatever it is to kind of regroup and, and that way we're gonna come together and debrief. You can do that in Cami as well by just turning off the tools and making it so that students don't have those tools anymore, okay? So I'm gonna hit okay. And as I do that, then your tools are gonna disappear. So in just a second, I'm going to see that you guys have, um, you know, kind of come back to the YouTube and I'm going to just do a demonstration and show you a bunch of things. We're going to start by kind of backing up the bus and just talking about like, how do we get started with Cami in case we have folks who are brand new to the tool, okay? And then we're gonna dig in to some things that are much more advanced. So what I'd love for you to do today is to think about Monday and someday, all right? So there may be things that you see today that you're like, oh, that's awesome. I could use that right away on Monday. Um, and then there may be things that are a little bit like, not sure if that makes sense if it doesn't resonate with you or it just seems a little complicated that might be a someday idea and that's okay too so you can just kind of file it away all right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to close out of this collaborative activity and i'm going to open up just a new tab and at this point if i want to go to cami i've got a couple of different options one is i could type in cami.app 
Okay, so Cami.app is going to take me to something called the dashboard of Cami. It's like the home screen. Okay, it's where we're going to get started with Cami. The other thing I could do to get to this dashboard is to use the Google Chrome extension. So purple circle with a K in it up at the top right of my screen. If I click on that, I get to the exact same spot. Okay, and you guys, this dashboard is kind of magical because it offers us the opportunity to be able to pull documents from our Google Drive from our computers, from something called the Cami Library. If you haven't been to the Cami Library recently, you need to go. Let me show you. I'm going to go over to the right-hand side of the screen where it says Browse Templates because this is like Christmas has come early or holidays have come early or your birthday has come early because there are over well, we're at 564 resources now. So you guys, these are all free. They're all templates. They're all um, available for you to use with your students. And you can use them in a variety of ways. You can use them in Cami, or you could use them on paper as well, because we know that there's times when it makes sense to do things digitally, and there's times when it makes sense to do things on paper. So if you are an English language arts teacher, for example, you might be glancing at some of these going, oh, that's a coloring sheet, and I'm not sure a word search makes sense for my kids. Well, you guys, what's happening is that these are sorted right now by popularity. But on the left-hand side of the screen, we have filters. So I could go down and say, hey, I'm an ELA teacher, and I'm also teaching seventh grade. And it's going to start to sort and filter for me. So now look at what I have. I've got all these really awesome graphic organizers, okay? Really cool things that we can use. So let's click on this cause and effect one. I love this one with the bowling balls and the pins. So if you notice, we can open this with Cami or we could download it for free, okay? So totally up to you. Everything's free. Have fun and play in there because there's a lot of stuff that I think will really help you in your classroom. Okay. So you guys, Cami is not about starting from scratch. It's not about reinventing the wheel and having to do things in a whole new way. It's about taking the stuff that you already have and augmenting it. We're going to look now at ways to kind of build some supports in for our students to kind of differentiate our instructional methods. And that way we can reach more of our kids consistently. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of build out an assignment and kind of talk through my ideas here. What I'll do is click right here where it says my computer. And I'm going to choose just a, a quick um, frog dissection JPEG. You guys, I picked this JPEG because I like to mention that you don't have to just bring PDF files into Cami. You can bring in image files, PNG files or JPEGs. You can bring in a Google slideshow. You could bring in a Google doc or a Word doc if you've got Microsoft stuff too, okay? So there's lots of possibilities for what you bring into Cami. And look, what happens is that it pops up and says, hey, it needs to be converted. And we say, yep, Cami, please do that for me. And Cami does, okay? So it's converting this file and the first thing I like to do when I bring a file into Cami is I like to make this environment comfortable for myself. And I tell my students to do the same thing. So what I'm going to do is use the zoom right here. And I like to zoom out to about 80%. The reason I do this is because I want my students and myself to be able to see the page, but I also want to be able to see the margin. And that's because the margin is a magical place where we can put comments. Now, you might be thinking, okay, comments are kind of for feedback. Well, we have more than just text-based comments in Cami. We have a variety of different comments. So follow my mouse over to the left-hand side, and you'll see the comment over here. And you're going to notice, yeah, we've got a text comment, and that's great. But we've also got a voice comment, a video comment, and a screen capture comment. So to begin with, the voice comment this is an audio recorder and it's built right into this environment. So you don't have to use some other, you know, audio recorder and then save the file and then try to insert it and all of that. Okay. It, it makes it for you and it stores it for you and it puts it right here into this file. Same thing with video and screen capture. Screen capture is like using Screencastify or Loom or Screencast-O-Matic, any one of those screencasting tools. But again, built right in, okay? You don't have to worry about where you save it or anything. It's just here. So what I could do 
is click on my voice comment. And then I could go up to the top right of the screen and I can click. And you guys, as soon as I click, it will immediately start to record my voice. So I can, I have up to five minutes with, with one comment and you can have multiple comments if you want. Not that I would suggest, you know, doing something where it's like 15 minutes long because kids aren't going to listen to that. But I can either read the directions that are on the page. I could reteach or do a quick little mini lesson, or I can just talk to my kids and tell them what to do. So check it out. Hey, friends, you did an amazing job last week when you were dissecting your frogs. So now it's your turn to show me what you know. You're going to label the parts of the frog with text boxes. Yes, you can work with your lab partners. And if you have any questions, let me know. So you guys, obviously, you are all not science teachers, right? And I know that. But this type of label the parts of something or let's add text boxes to the page can be found, I think, in a lot of different curricular areas. So do me a favor. And if you're not you know, a biology teacher, transform this in your mind into something that makes sense for you and your kids, OK? So that was voice. And that is now built right in. And kids can hit play. And they can listen to those directions as many times as they need in order to be successful, okay? Now, what if you might be thinking, okay, but my kids aren't going to know how to make the text boxes. Well, that's when the magic of the screen capture comes in. So I'm going back over to comment. And this time I'm going to choose screen capture. And I'm going to click on that again and come over and click somewhere on the page. And now I'm going to tell it which monitor I want to record. You probably will only see one if you're just on your computer. And as soon as I hit share, now I'm recording. So you guys, I could go over and say, okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to click here on the text box tool, and then you're going to click inside the box and you're going to label the parts of the frog. Or you guys, if you wanted to show them how to use the dictionary tool or how to use the read aloud tool, you could do that as well. And I'll, we'll explore some of those in a few minutes. But if you wanted to say to kids, hey, listen, if you put it in the wrong spot, no worries. You can just click on it and then you've got this toolbar right here. And this little crosshair is our way of being able to take text boxes and move them around, so on and so forth. You guys, I'm going to hit done right here. And I'm just doing a quick demo, but I could have recorded for up to 20 minutes. So you've got lots of recording time and that's recording your screen. You can also record yourself. OK, so you could do a video. So if you wanted to read a story to students or if you wanted to stand at your board and, you know, project or do the camera this way and work a math problem or something like that, you could do that as well. So you've got lots of opportunities to be able to kind of take this digital learning experience and, and add some supports in for students so that that way they can be successful. So when we think about utilizing digital activities versus like our analog activities, right? Something on paper, we often want to think about, you know, what are the functional improvements? Why use the technology? And I think this is a big one because I know that we've got students in our classroom where the first time that they hear instructions, they're good to go, right? We've got a small population that's off and running and they're good. And then we've got our students who were absent that day. We have students who are chronically absent. We have some who are neurodiverse and just process information more slowly. And how wonderful is it for them to be able to hear their teacher's voice Hey friends, you did an amazing job over and over again, as many times as they need without having to admit that they need it, okay? So now I've got my activity kind of ready, right? I, I've added some supports in. I'm gonna go ahead and maybe delete. Oops, um, hold on one second, let me stop that. I had the wrong thing selected. Um, I'm gonna delete these because now what I wanna do is just kind of show you how we're going to push this into Schoology, okay? Um, what the first thing I want to make sure to do is make sure that this is saved in my Google Drive. And what happens normally, guys, is that Cami will save automatically to your Google Drive, okay? But I always double check when I'm in this kind of environment because sometimes my Wi-Fi is a little slow and it doesn't work. So here I need to go down to Google Drive and just choose Upload. And as I do that, then it's putting it in Google Drive and it puts it in a folder called Cami Uploads. Now, if you are someone who is really organized and doesn't want it to be in Cami Uploads, if you'll follow my mouse up to the top left, you're going to see right here, this is the folder it's in. 
I can click on this and I can go put it somewhere else if I want. If you want it to go into a unit folder or something, you totally can. And then up here, this is the file name. So maybe I don't want the word JPEG there, right? And maybe I want to make sure that I know this one is for third period. Okay, so I just want to make sure I give it a good file name and a good location where I can find it. And that way, then, if when I head over to Schoology, I can start to add this in now. Ryan, I just realized that I didn't pause and give you time to share. Would you like to do that now before I hop into the learning management system? Sure, that would be great. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and throw the attendance code up on the screen for you guys. Remember, write this down, um, or if you would like to, you can go ahead and visit the bit.ly that's on the screen. So if you are in district, if you are joining us here in CFISD, go to the bit.ly slash edtechlive, and then capital CFISD on the end of that. And then for those of our friends joining us from outside of SciFair ISD, if you will go to the, the second bit.ly there, the bit.ly slash edtechlive, and then visitor is all capital there. Now you can go ahead and start entering your codes. This code for this session is magical because Cami has so much magic to it, and I am excited to learn more about it. So I'm going to go ahead and send it back over to you, Avra, to continue showing all of the, the wonderful, magical things we can do with Cami. Awesome. Thank you so much. I apologize. No, I'm you're glad good. Glad I figured it out. And I do have the chat up there now. I had it, but then it went away. So, all right, guys, I'm going to share my screen again. And we are in Schoology. So Schoology um, has wonderful Cami integration built right in. Okay. So I'm going to go here to add materials once I'm inside of one of my classes. And over on the right-hand side, we see Cami as an option right here, okay? So it becomes very easy to just now go and access my Google Drive right here and go find that file, which if you recall, is in the folder called Cami Uploads, okay? And so here it is, guys, and it's got all the stuff that I added to it and it brings it right in here to Schoology. One thing to quickly mention is that there is an assessment mode built in. So if you are doing more of a summative assessment, a quiz or a test, you can definitely use that. That will allow um, like an auto submit, okay? So it'll make it so that if you say, hey, it's due by Friday, you know, it'll, it'll automatically submit it for students even if they don't submit it. It'll also, it does make it though where kids can't get it back because it was an assessment. So keep that in mind and use it when appropriate. And then you guys look, control features, all right? This is huge because this is the same thing I was showing you before, but you can do it for individual assignments as well as that group space that we looked at earlier. So if you, you can go through and say, hey, I don't need, they don't need all this, right? Like, you know, if you noticed, even in the ad media, which I didn't mention, you guys, there's the option to bring a YouTube like file or um, video in. And you may not want your kids to have that. There might be times when it's appropriate and there might be times when it's not. So we can turn, turn these off and say, you know what, for this, they need the text box tool, right? And we want them to have the mouse, the select tool. Now, what I would love to mention though, is that by giving students the ability to record their voice or video or screen capture, any of those tools, we take our lesson to the next level and differentiate their ways of demonstrating their understanding. So if this were a different assignment, maybe this was a math problem that they worked instead of it being this labeling uh, uh, activity. What if you had them actually explain their thinking? behind the math problem, right? So sometimes when kids do things digitally and we're not with them, we're often wondering, did they really understand this? Or maybe did they get a little help from someone or something like that? But by having them have to verbalize their thoughts, not only does it give them the option to be able to show you what they know, but it gives you the chance to really get a sense of where their gaps in understanding might be or how just how they're doing, okay? So think about, utilizing this, you could just create a quick exit ticket and say, hey, tell me something that you learned today and tell me something that you're struggling with, right? And letting them do that with a voice comment instead of having to type out sentences, 
think about the kids that will talk your ear off, right? The ones that you know, just know so much and they love to talk, but then you put a pencil in their hand or a keyboard under their fingers. And all of a sudden you get very short sentences. You get very unsophisticated vocabulary. And you're like, I know they know more, but they don't like to type or they don't like, they don't want to write it out or they've got barriers with the reading and the writing. So letting them talk is an awesome option as well. So just keep that in mind. That was a quick side note, okay? So you guys, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna head down to the bottom of the page because I want you to notice this. Copy and paste, spell check, and the ability to add pages. Those are all things that you can control as well. So do you want kids to be able to copy and paste things from other websites? You know, right-clicking on text and copying and pasting it. Same thing with images. Sometimes you may, sometimes you might not. So totally up to you. Check the box or not. Same thing with spell check, okay? And add pages. So I'm going to hit OK. And then I'm going to hit proceed and it's going to take me back into Schoology and give me my little box where I can go in and add some of those additional. Um, well, it's supposed to give me the little box and it does this to me sometimes. I apologize, guys. Let me log out real quick and log back in. Um, sometimes when I've got too many tabs going and stuff like that, it can be goofy. All right. Let's go back in. Oh. Here it is now. Let me go over now and see if it shows up for my student account. All right, it did. So you guys, what I want to just do is show you now what it looks like for our students so you can get a quick peek at that. Um, I'm in a student account now and I'm going to click here. And when I do this, what I like to teach my students is to find the full screen button, which is this button right up here. OK, and when they do this, then I like to tell them click on it. And that way it goes full screen, okay? You guys, it's popping up right now and it's asking, hey, do you wanna recognize text? And here's the cool thing. I always, I, I'm not going to for this, but I always like to mention that we have this wonderful text recognition that's built in. So any of you could take a picture of a page in a book. You could take a picture of an anchor chart on the wall and you can bring it into Cami, and it will run text recognition and it'll make it so that text can be read aloud and can be defined, which I'm gonna show you in just a little bit, okay? So I'm gonna say no thanks, but be aware that that is there for you. And Kimmy often will ask you if you even want it. So you guys, this is what it looks like for kids. Again, they can hit play. Hey friends, they can listen. They could hit play down here. Now I'm recording. So you guys, I could go up. Also, you guys, there is a full screen button here so they can watch the video full screen. Okay, and if you notice, we've even got captions that are built in. So lots of wonderful accessibility um, options for students. Kids can come use their text box tool and they can type in these boxes. And then when they're done, they're gonna go up to the top right and they're gonna go to the submit button. And when they do that, it drops down a menu where there's another little button here, okay? And so you teach them click here, click here and then watch for confetti. So confetti is their visual cue that says they're done. Okay. Woohoo. They've turned it in. So now what I want to do is hop back over and just be a teacher here for a second and show you what it looks like. Because if I click now I can go in and open the grader. And what's really cool is that I'll have all of the Cami tools built in, in order to give feedback. So when we think about the kind of the cycle of all of this, now we're at the feedback place, right? So you guys definitely, I'm going to use the full screen button here. And then again, I like to zoom out a couple of times because if this were something where I was asking my kids to reflect on their learning and they had maybe done it verbally or through a video, or maybe this was an activity where students were doing a mock interview with one another and they used the front facing camera to do that. I'd wanna be able to see this over here, okay? So using that zoom to make the, the environment you know, easier to see is really, really key, okay? And then don't forget, we've got drawing tools over here so we can circle this and go, hello, that doesn't look like a word, okay? And so, you know, you've got all of these kind of tools that are built in, as well as guys, comment tools are all here too for feedback. Okay. So you've got the option to record your voice and talk to them about how they could improve on their work and that kind of thing. All right. I see a question that has come in about embedding a video from another site. So you can embed within this, you can embed a YouTube video. Okay. So that's the, that's the one option we've got. Let me hop back over and just kind of show you 
in my full cami window here. Um, if we go to add media and we come to YouTube, um, we can then from there, let me just go grab a YouTube video here real quick. We can grab the URL. Let's say that I've got two Chuck. And we can bring it in. Okay, so YouTube is an option. Um, if your video is housed on a different site, you can add links in Cami. Okay, so what we could do is do a text box and you could say, let me move this down. Hold on a second. All right, watch this video. Okay, and you can highlight these words and then go up right here, you guys. So in this formatting toolbar over here, we have a link option. So if you have a page, for example, that has a video on it, you could link to it by clicking here. And then if you notice right here, it says enter link. So I can paste that in and hit save. And now there's an active link in here. So you can absolutely, um, you know, have kids link out and be able to see videos. Okay. So thanks so much for the question. I'm so glad to have gotten it. So, okay, I know that I've got Cami friends out there who are answering questions, okay, but I just want to make sure that, you know, everybody's doing okay, so please let me know and I'll keep an eye on the chat, see if there's anything else that has come in before I jump over and kind of show you a couple more things. So I'm just going to, I'm going to kind of open up another Cami file here and talk through some other ideas, but I do, I do want you to ask questions if you've got them, okay. You guys, what I'm going to do now is head to Google Drive and pull up a very text-based document because I want to show you some of the amazing things that we've got in here. All right. So let's say that we've got a reading, right? And we want students to perhaps, you know, do some annotation or even just have text read to them. Let's talk for a few minutes about these wonderful accessibility tools, okay? So to begin with, the dictionary tool. If we click on it and we go over and then just you know click on a word we've got the pop-up menu with the definition you guys we've even got read aloud built into this now attack take aggressive action against a okay so lots of options there and then read aloud in general is also just built in so we can highlight some words while reading consider how you would have responded and reacted. And if you notice, there are these tools here, okay, that are kind of a sub menu of the read aloud and they have things like stop and play and um, previous sentence and next sentence and things like that. There's even a speed at the bottom. So that way then um, students can increase or decrease the speed that the words are being read, okay? Um, the thing to mention here is that these tools are, things that have to be taught, right? But they can be an awesome thing if you take the time to really dive in and teach them these tools. Again, when you're thinking about like the STAR test, they will then have been familiar with things like the dictionary tool, okay? Um, same thing with highlighters, all right? So if I go to this markup tool, we have several different types of highlighters. There's a text highlighter. So the text highlighter I love because it's nice and neat, okay? It does this kind of a thing where it just neatly, highlights the words, but then there's also a freehand highlighter. So then you'll get to see the lack of my fine motor skills here. Okay. But this is kind of nice too, because sometimes you, you might want kids to be able to draw something or circle something like that. Okay. So it's almost like a drawing tool. And then there's also a whole box highlighter and the box highlighter is going to do something more like this, where we just like can do a whole section. So you can use those as, as the teacher, you know, to be able to kind of get an assignment ready for kids. Like, hey, you know, the question, question number two is going to have, you know, it's going to be, the answer is going to be found somewhere here inside this green box or something like that. But you can also have your students be able to use these tools to be able to, um, you know, annotate text and things like that. So those are all fantastic supports for students. There's an additional support too when we think about kids answering questions. And that is when we go to the text box tool, if I click here, I need to stop doing this at the top of the page. Let me do it down here. There we go. You guys way over on the right-hand side, I don't know if you noticed or not, but there is a voice typing feature. So at this point, I can actually dictate comma and it does a pretty good job of transcribing what I say, period. 
So if you want students to be able to answer questions, you know, if you're not worried about assessing spelling and grammar and things like that, this is a wonderful support for students, um, you know, as they are being able to show what they know. Okay, so um, so those are things I wanted to show. The last thing I want to mention is kind of a, a different utility. Um, it's a, another part of Cami, and so it's outside of this Cami environment. Let me hop in and just go to my I'll go to my extension here. And the last thing is something called Split and Merge. You guys, this is a gift. If you've never met Split and Merge. This is, this is my gift to you here during our holiday season. Split and Merge allows us to take large documents and split them apart or bring many documents and merge them together. Let me show you. If I click here, I can go and I can pull things from my Google Drive or I could just click and go to my computer. Okay, if I click and go to my computer, I can grab my frog dissection, bring that here, bring it in. And then what I'm doing is I'm going to go to my um, Google Drive as well and go in and grab some of these things here. So I'll grab this. Nah, I don't want to do that one. I just messed that one up. I'll do this one. I'll do this one. And I'll do this one. You guys, what I did just now is held down control on my keyboard in order to select more than one document at a time. And then I'm going to hit select and it's going to load all those up. Okay. So now I've got the ones that I want. I want to, I want to build a packet for my kids. So I'm going to hit next. And what happens is it brings them in and it puts them each on their own row. So these are individual files. Okay. If I forgot one, I can go down to the bottom right and go and grab something. Okay. But what I'm going to do now is say, okay, I want my kids to start out by doing this. And then I want them to do this reflection activity, drag and drop. I'm just bringing it right up. And then, Hey, we're going to do this graphic organizer. Oh, but wait, we need to start with the reading passage first. So I'm going to go like that. And then if I'm like, wait, what is this one? I don't know what that is. Oh, no worries. There's a preview page button right here. Okay. Oh, that's that awesome reflection activity. I love that activity. I want to clone it again, series of icons right down here and click. And now there's another one. So I could end with that one as well. I can drag and drop these around. I can do whatever I want when I'm happy with it. I can say packet number one, I can give it a good file name and export it. Where am I going to export it to? Cami, if I want to push it straight into Cami, download it if I want to print it. Okay. What if you had a bunch of Google Docs that were your students' work and you wanted to be able to print them? Have you ever tried to do that from a Google Drive file? You have to open each one, file and print, close it, go and open the next one. Just bring them all in here. Go right into, you know, a um, Schoology, sorry, not Google Classroom, but go in and grab the stuff from your Schoology folder in your Google Drive. And you can absolutely bring in a bunch of student work and print it. OK, or you guys, you could save it right to your Google Drive. Totally up to you. Vice versa. And this will be the last thing I say. OK, if you have a large file, sometimes you may have bought something on Teachers Pay Teachers or you get something from a textbook publisher that's like 50 pages long and all you want is page two for them to do. Right. Watch if I hit next. And this is the page. This is the only one I want them to do. All I have to do is drag it down and go and give it a new name, ratios, page two, and hit export and push it into Cami or wherever you want it to go. So if you've got large files, you can split them. If you've got a bunch of files you want to bring together, make them one file so you can do something with it, you can do that as well. Okay, that's split and merge. So that's all found on this agenda document and remind you that I only had 50 minutes with you today. And I know you all know, being a teacher, that I wish I had two or three hours, right? So if you want to learn more, if you felt like you were drinking from a fire hose and you're overwhelmed, just send me an email, okay? And I am here. We can get together in a Google Meet or a Zoom or whatever. We can email back and forth. I can do whatever it takes to support you, okay? And I would love to do that. So if there's anything I can do, let me know. There is a feedback survey here. If you'd like to give us feedback, it always helps us improve, okay? And I appreciate so much the opportunity to be here today. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today, Alvaro. We really appreciate you taking your time um, on this Saturday to help our teachers look, kind of go past just the annotation tool. And I really do love um, the fact that I know when we were um, virtual, we created a lot of like hyperdocs became the thing, you know, mm -hmm. to use. Um, and we can still pull those into Cami and we can have 
our lesson right there with all of those tools. So I don't have to ask my students to go here and go here and do that. It, it's all in one location and it's so nice. And that split and merge tool was a game changer when that came out, let me just say. <laughs> yeah, I love it too. And I'm so glad you mentioned that about HyperDocs. I ran out of time, so I didn't have time to show it, but I take a lot of HyperDocs, put them into Cami, and then I add my voice. I read the instructions or I'll read a passage of text if I'm working with elementary kids or whatever. And just having all of those multimedia tools built right in, it's it's really nice just so that we don't have to use so many different tools. So exactly. Yeah. The I mean, typically more the merrier, but not no, I like it in one spot. <laughs> right. Well, it's easier. Sometimes it's easier just for, for workflow for teachers, but also that way it's not so overwhelming for kids, you know, because Absolutely. a lot of times having them record in Screencastify and then have to insert it into Google Slides and all of that can be a lot. So this, yeah, it's a nice thing and it just keeps getting better and better. So that'd be the other thing to mention is that if teachers have ideas or wondering about something that they didn't see today, they can always reach out because our engineers are always looking for new ideas and teachers ideas are what guide progress at Cami. Awesome. That is, that is really good to know. So, hey, teachers, listen up. <laughs> if you, there's something after you use Cami Wild, there's something you're like, hmm, this might be interesting. Share it with Cami and let them know. Yeah, for sure. You can email me. There's a, there's lots of places. There's like a question mark up at the top, right. When you're in a Cami document that you can hit and there's a, you can request training, individual training that way too. So lots of supports built in for teachers as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you again so much for joining us here today. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of our teachers are going to be reaching out to you uh, to get to dive deeper into Cami because there's just so much they can do with it. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, you guys have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you so much for having me. You do the same. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We have loved having you. Um, we've loved watching the chat and being able to talk with y'all during our sessions today. I know I learned a lot. I did too. I, uh, Kimmy is amazing. When I first yeah. started seeing it, it didn't have half the functions that she went over. So this is great for teachers. Absolutely. And it's, it's good for students too. Um, there were a lot of apps and tools that were, were shared today. All of them are, can be used to help our students grow and go further with their learning. And ultimately that's what we want. Um, you can stay and hop over to channel B and go check out the sessions that they had today. Um, I apologize, there's, there's a, we have a fire truck going by our office right now. <laughs> Yay for live, it yes. happens. Anyways, eight hours, you can't, that's nine. Here's eight, you can get, <laughs> you can get a total. I need more coffee. You can get a total of eight hours of PD credit for the day if you would like to go see the other channel and all the wonderful sessions that they had there. Um, but again, thank you guys for joining us. We really appreciate it. We will be back here for another Ed Tech Live on March 25th, 2023. It'll be here before you know it. I know, we're already in December, y'all. But remember, even if you don't stay and watch them right now, you have until midnight tomorrow night to, and if that uh, section had as much learning as this one, you'll be wanting to pay attention and get your credit, your PD credit for all of these sessions. They were amazing. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you guys for doing such a great job with this. Thanks. This just got weird. Okay, y'all have a wonderful Saturday. Join us back here on March 25th for our next EdTech Live, and we will see you then. <laughs>